priest or grand, that is better described by the this person. You might be knowing the name of uh, Harari. It is a leading social scientist of uh, of um, Israel. Uh, what he described, I am just reading out some quotes from Harari. Actually, these are from three books. I will mention the names of the books after this particular slide. We are living in a new and frightened era of post truth, and that lies and actions are better all described by the in fact, this person human are who always in the name of in an age of post truth, uh, homo sapiens in a post truth species whose power depends on creating and believing fiction, ever seeing the stone age, self reinforcing myths absorbed to unite human collectives. Indeed, homo sapiens conquered this planet, hence, above all, to the unique human ability to create and spread fictions. We are the only mammals that can cooperate with numerous strangers because only we can invent fictional stories, spread them around and convince millions of others to believe in them. As long as everybody believes in the same fiction, we all obey the same law, law and can thereby cooperate effectively. Yes, this is the feature. It happened during the Nazi era the semitism was there jews were killed and it was it was established by the nazi propagandist yes it is rational so that is the ability of the homo sapien ability of the homo human being fiction and make united millions of people to believe in a in a particular law in a particular so what is happened in case of uh, in case of uh, rather food, football playing ground we are mohan bagan you are east bengal in the case of state, Soviet, Russia, China, America, India, we are all the concept of nations. It is the spreading of stories and fictions by which we are uniting the people to serve our purpose. This purpose, in the most cases, is detrimental to, for the civilization. Okay. And these are some references of Harari. Uh, you might be known these books. And I, I, this is my suggestion. If you do not read this book, please read. And these are the unique piece of unique book of uh, present time. Okay, there are uh, some uh, suggesting this tree. Goebbelsian, you might know of Joseph Goebbels, the media maestro of the then Nazi regime. Okay, and uh, and actually Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda maestro, perhaps the most accomplished media wizard of the modern age, Alex explained. His method subsequently stating, lie told once remains lie, but a lie told a thousands of times become the truth. Another pearl of wisdom ascribed by Goebbels says that the most brilliant propaganda is technique will yield. Definitely, it is a deliberative attitude. It defines like that the term fake news means news articles that are intentionally verifiable and false. Mind it, intentionally and verifiable and false. Designed to manipulate people's perception of real facts, events, and statements. It is about information presented as new, that is known by the promoter to be false, based on facts that are demonstrably incorrect, or statements or events that are verified did not happen. Right. These are the, it, absolutely, it is the intentional, intentionally spreading the uh, false items. To uh, spread rumor among the uh, stakeholders, and it can it can create havoc. You might be seeing in recent times, in a, during the Corona days, during the riots of different places in India and abroad. So fake news have the huge potential to be mismanaged people, to uh, motivate people in different type of unintentional activities. So I uh, am not going to read the second one. But this is the ba basic definition or basic description of fake news. There are so many uh, rather synonymous terms, or near synonym terms, uh, fabricated content, manipulated content, imposter, etc. Et These are the, some uh, enumeration of different terms having synonym or near synonym with fake news, misinformation, disinformation, whatever you call it. All these are almost same. These are spread by some people. Man, a malified uh, attitude, malified intention uh, among the mass to do some uh, 
do some uh, in, uh, unjustified act activities, etc. But fake news, misinformation, disinformation, not uh, it is a uh, is a present day term. It was with us from BC. I am giving you some timelines. Okay. It is the uh, what I have collected. It is the 63 BC. It was first. I have the example. Roman Emperor Augustus of Tiberius. Don't mind the name of the name, and it is related to the Mark Antony. The, he was the husband of Cleopatra, of the then uh, Egyptian queen. Okay, what he did, Augustus of Tiberius spread rumors, disinformation in support of his, in support of Roman Empire. Okay, just to uh, this was the anti-Mark Antony propaganda spread by the Augustus of Tiberius. So it was there. It is there. It will be there. That is the destiny of human being. Second one is 1475. There are so many, but I have collected this, this much. Okay. A false story of this particular uh, clergyman. There was anti-Semitism activities, the anti-Jew activities. 15 people were falsely accused, found guilty and tortured. All are Jew. And it was a, uh, this information was spread by a clergyman. 17th and 17th, uh, 16th and 17th century after the invent of printing press by Gutenberg, Gutenberg in German, uh, the spreading of printed gossip and malafide news was rampant. And purposefully, somebody is spreading this to uh, motivate people. And these gentlemen, all of us are very familiar with the na name Benjamin Franklin. Actually, he was a great scientist and definitely one of the forefather uh, uh, father figure of American revolutionary history. But he did some massive mischievous activities when uh, uh, with definitely with some political motivated activities uh, to to torture the Native American, the black people during that time. Okay. Moon hoax, 1835 published in so many newspaper of United States of America. I will show one picture what was uh, what was published in uh, 1835. It says that uh, uh, it says that uh, some creature uh, animal like creature inhabiting in the moon in the uh, it is the, it was uh, termed as moon hoax. And almost 18, 800 to 1900 copies. Mind it, it is 1835, not uh, 2021. 1835, circulation of 800 to 19, uh, sorry, 18,000 to 19,000, it's not a matter of joke. It was circulated throughout the United States of America, spreading the rumor, the existence of animal like creature in the moon. It is known as moon hoax. It was spread widely. Okay, 1844. Anti-Catholic newspaper Philadelphia published stories falsely accused Irishman robbing school and stealing Bible. And there was a huge riot in Philadelphia in that time. I'm not reading out all the uh, uh, slides, because time is limited. It is important. 1915, a rumor of German Corpus factory was a major source of anti-German propaganda during World War. Newspaper of official source claimed that members of German military were extracting fat from dead soldiers to make soap, food for animals and other materials. Almost 10 years later, a British general admitted that he, he made up the story. Just mind, what type of propaganda? Yes, we know that in the Nazi German, uh, the situation was very bad, etc., etc. But some, some rumors are also there to anti-Nazi propaganda. It is one of the example of that. Okay. Uh, so I'm not reading, it is most important, uh, uh, 1927. Important means uh, relevant to the topic I am discussing. Dorothy Cornett in Logan, a British doctor claims to swim English Channel for 13 hours straight. He was celebrated, it was celebrated by a newspaper and party was organized. Finally, it was found that most of the travel which she did secretly by journey to a boat. But he was um, uh, felicitated and prized by the authority. Okay. So these are the rumors spread all over the world. 
I'm giving some example also. Yes, 1983, the Pet, the Petcher newspaper published the article AIDS may invade India, mystery disease caused by US experience. False story was picked up by major newspaper in 50 countries and cited an anonymous American scientist suggesting deadly news disease had been created by the Pentagon in a bid to develop new biological weapons. So these are the different type of news items published in newspaper uh, with anonymous authority, etc., to spread rumors among the mass. And this is the moon hoax picture published in Guardian. Okay, see, it was illustrated, painted, and circulated widely in 1835 in United States of America. It is another uh, example of spreading of fake news known as Cottomley fairies. When photograph was invented, it was thought to be an equivalent to truth. It was truth with a capital T by Vicky Goldberg. Okay. It was quickly learned, seeing is not always believing. Even in the early history of photograph, folks like Cottomley fairies taught people to question the validity of the image. It is a peculiar feature of Cottomley fairy. Cottomley Ferry appears in a series of five photographs taken by Elsie Wright and Francis Griffith uh, in the year 1917, 1917. The first fo two photographs were taken when Elsie was 16 and uh, Francis was 19. The picture came to the attention of writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who used to them to illustrate an article on fairies. He had been commissioned to write the Christmas 1920 edition of the Standard Magazine. Doyle, as a spiritualist, was enthusiastically about the photographs and interpreted them as clear and visible evidence of psychic phenomena. It was absolutely flawed, finally committed by these two young, uh, young uh, girl when they were matured. Okay, so it was absolutely fake news, false news rather. Another example, how scientists can fabricate their uh, invention. It was the sheer case of fabrication. Definitely, this is a fake item. Report of hominid remains found in Sussex, England. It is an example of missing link, later shown to be skull of modern man and jawbone and orangutan. Just imagine skull of modern man, homo sapien ladder, and jawbone and orangutan joined together and uh, evidentified as a missing link of hominid. And definitely these two particular gentlemen with the instrument, Charles Dawson and Martin Hinton, most probably was the creator of this hoax. Okay. Fake news generator. Who generates fake news? There are so many people, one by one. I can tell him a joker. Dr. K. L. Sundar Raj, it is a recent past. It is a one year back it happened. Sundar Krishna, nuclear and art scientist, believed that coronavirus has broken out after a muted particle interaction, first neutron due to fission, fission energy emitted after the solar eclipse. Sundar Krishna was, is definitely a nuclear scientist and he spread this rumor among the among the among among us rather. Okay. Example, fantastic example. Justice, you might be knowing all of us known this year. I am repeating is the justice Mohesh Chandra Sharma. He was a um, judge of high uh, Rajasthan High Court judge. Okay. What he says? The peacock is a lifelong brahmachari. It never has sex with pihen. The peahen gets pregnant after swallowing the tears of the peacock. Who said this? It is said by Justice Mohesh Chandra Sharma. I have already mentioned at the beginning of my uh, presentation, almost all the fake news are coming from the very higher sphere of the society. So do not believe who said this. Rely on what he said. That is the most important. Who said this, that is not important. What he said, that is important. Okay. Rely on your intelligence, cognitive faculty. So this type of, uh, this type of uh, false news, purposeful interpretation of something is spread by some people like uh, Justice 
politician religious guru etc so reliance of this on them on their statement may create havoc so we should rely on our intelligence on our cognitive faculty okay scammers you might be all of us is victim of some false email we are getting and uh, i think i think all of us is a victim of this type of malafide activities politicians one example once donald president donald trump questioned whether exposing patient bodies to uv light or injecting bleach could help treat the coronavirus he was speculating and took facts out of context another feature a feature of indian cow that it milk contains gold that the reason the color of milk is yellowish i i do not going to mention the name of who who parled it but these are the facts one by proposed by our dearest president trump and one by our politician of our state okay so this misinformation uh, falsely fat information coming from politicians also spread running and this thing went in the case yes it happened during the covid days so many rumors are gone just this particular gentleman quick fit another uh, rumor specialist rather what he did is extremely mischievous activities and you can feel he was actually a anti vaccination propagandist anti vaccination personality propagandist mmr you might be know the mmr mumps measles and rubella rubella mumps mmr stands for mumps measles and rubella actually he spread news that children who are taking mmr is likely to prone to be uh, uh, to be rather uh, brain illness rather uh, illness rather likely okay so uh, finally it was proved that proved that it was absolutely false to those who are taking uh, mmr are not prone to the autism finally he was convicted and fine and fired jailed okay so the rumor was spread by a scientist andrew wakefield insiders sometimes insiders like doctors professional hospital workers nurses etc spread some newspaper sometimes in not done malafide or with, with some intention but spreading of false news is there they are also spread out of relatives sometimes our relatives who close to us without any intention without any intention sometimes they are also trapped and after trapped they realize they are trapped and spreading some uh, misinformation to the other people okay celebrity uh, it was happened in during the corona days in 2020 uh, there is a relation between the 3g spectrum as well as corona vira the use of 3g may uh, may enhance the possibility of spreading of corona it was spread by singer mia mia an actor ugi harrison so celebrity like mia and harrison also spreading and there are so many numbers are there they are spreading misinformation fake news within the community some examples of spread news after the uh, president when sworn in as the president of india He earned 3.25 million followers on Twitter within minutes of taking over as an Indian Foreign Minister. Absolutely fake news. It was spread by a newspaper. He gained, by attained, secured 3.25 million followers within minutes. Absolutely fake. This news item was widely spread throughout India, different, basically uh, through or via social media. Finally, it was true. it was not stated by rotan tata it was uh, it's stated by someone else but in the name of rotan tata this news item was spread throughout india absolutely fake information actually this is a scene from a bhojpuri movie uh, circulated as a dolit woman was stripped by one bsp leader finally it was found that this particular picture is taken from a bhojpuri movie and it was widely circulated definitely it creates some uh, creates some uh, atrocity among the people who have witnessed this particular item another about very uh, very uh, popular it was 
master stroke diplomacy by pm uh, bm sri narendra modi what he said actually about the daud ibrahim it never taken place it was absolutely false news okay this particular photograph is from pakistan passed off as bengal violence uh, during 2020 or i may be wrong it is 2019 2020 in some part of west bengal violence are there but this particular picture is not associated with that type of violence or uh, uh, miscreant activities this image is taken from pakistan and circulated as happened in some part of west bengal another picture student swings of pakistan prime minister iran iman khan party tehreek e insaf party uh, had colluded with isi and uh, pushed several fake items and video message to further fuel on this during the communal riots in north east delhi so spreading of news i uh, pictures photographs is much catchy rather than the textual information textual material you know all of us it is known to all of us so this type of picture we don't know what it happened but spreading this about in uh, photographs uh, videos etc can fuel the communal activities miscreant activities in any part of the world and this is i think the highest of everything i am simply reading out this and just imagine yes 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 we are living in a definitely post truth society what happened in macedonia in the republic of macedonia on the bank of river varda lies the city valles city of valles population only nearly 44000 in 19th century wooden house that lies and stick uh, stick street a reminder of a time when the city was at the peak forming part of the trade route connected the balkan peninsula and the aegean sea via river while globalization might be responsible for the deindustrialization of the city it was unexpected consequence of globalization that have made valles famous for more recent months why it, it has been famous Valles is a city that now hosts over 100 US political websites. 100 US US political websites. The city has started trading the new industry fake news. The particular city in Macedonia is famous. Why it is famous? It is it 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 started trading in a new industry fake news, and it is the digitally savvy teenager. of the city who are reaping and rewards by most of the news websites that are based on uh, pro trump and teenager responsible for them are reported as caring caring little about the uh, knowing little about the us politics and outcome of the election their glow their goal is to create controversial comment to be shared virtually across social media platform and they are earning huge amount of money and they are paying the taxes so uh, it is part of not surprising that the mayor of valles described the mod, uh, monetization of fake news sites as a success story of the city just imagine uh, trading of what do i leave whom do i trust so definitely we are reaching i believe right now we are living in a post truth society but how to get get rid of this there are some measures being a professional librarian professional information professional we should be must be careful about the way the time is limited so i am not reading out all this these are the points to be remembered consider the source you must uh, try to uh, consider which, from which source you are taking it not simply read the uh, title of a particular article just read the whole story what is written or printed in that item check who is the author who are what are the supporting sources check definitely it is most important check the date whether it is a joke or not check your bias and if not all fails you can ask any expert to decipher what is within the item and what we need to do media literacy media literacy is the ability to think critically and about the information we we consume and create 
includes the ability to distinguish fact and opinion yes this is the ability how to uh, how to judge whether information is fake information or right information that is the ability we call it a media literacy and that is a must right now we should uh, train ourselves if not already done the how to read news how to judge a photograph whether it is a false or not so it is a technique all the information profession not only the information profession all the people who are consuming information consuming data or consuming news should know how to deal with this factors emotional intelligence yes sometimes tv uh, advertisers are selling the uh, uh, selling their items with some with some peculiarity emotional business it is emotional business they are passing the message as it is a lifestyle with a family affair Mm -hmm. like this so we must be cautious careful what is paid by different and act. these are the all the corporate sectors putting this type of families family lifestyle through the advertising we must be careful about this okay so my last uh, what i am going to say is that we must must be careful i have already mentioned you just it is not important to us who said this it is important to us what he said rely on your intelligence actually what what is happening nowadays the wolf is roaming within the us in the guise of a lamb be careful rely on your intelligence your cognitive faculty with this thank you for this invitation and patience here okay you have anything to say thank see. you so much sir uh thank you so much uh for such an in depth low down on the life cycle of fake news the various spatial and temporal context make it really outstanding sir or well, uh, we have some questions for here sure. in the box uh afterwards i'll also like to share my observation on it well the question first question that has come is uh, what actions does government take on spreading of the fake news or rather what action the government should take to prevent the spreading of the fake news it is yeah, a, yeah, yeah rigorous measures should be taken rigorous measures should be taken fine jail whatever it may be rigorous punishment can only prevent actually actually we are uh, we are comp uh, we are actually sometimes we are uh, what can i say the um, compel we have to compel people do not spread this type of information if there is filing system there is uh, judiciary system is strong enough people will people will prevent of doing this type of mischievous activities that is the way that is the way rule must rule must be for all whoever it may be i have already mentioned who said this that is not important what he said that is information it is said by even if the prime minister that uh, that is also a crime okay even if you have a person a false information that is also a crime so judiciary system must be active super active to punish this type of mischievous activities just identify and punish them not no no uh, uh, do not elongate the process that should be the message to all if whoever it may be it may be a religious guru it may be a politician it may be a judge it may be a common people whoever it may be judiciary should step appropriate step to prevent all this of non type of nonsense yes that is very correct one should be very uh, objective when it comes to uh, maintaining law order as per the constitution the second question would be what are the weapons that a common man having against false propaganda a legal uh, legal options legal weapons that is what this person mean first of all i have already uh, mentioned yeah. that there are some uh, there are some methodology by which you can identify what is fake what is false and what yeah. is true there are methodologies and for this method media literacy is most important if you find some information is fake you can inform there are uh, legal uh, rather uh, intelligence cells for all the state in our state hopefully it is in the bhavani bush okay so cyber state is there mostly this fake news has spread through the social media and uh, via web or internet version okay so straight away inform the uh, crime cyber section cyber law section to take appropriate step that is the only thing which by which we can prevent this type of uh, spreading of this rumor and you also said about talked about the media literacy part which yes, is also yes that is that is for us that is for us for us means i am talking about the all the citizen of of this society 
we must identify what is fake what is false and what is true that is the that that the skill we should train ourselves that is the way by which we can protect ourselves after that after that we can uh, sue uh, case uh, inform police inform cyber cell these are the next type measure but first of all we should prevent ourselves protect ourselves from absorbing this type of wrong information misinformation yeah so true now sir just my question yeah sure huh. i am just wondering as you sir also experienced and experimenting with the frontline areas of the uh, computational and information science is it possible if you, even if in the future to recognize some sort of pattern in the fake news historical and present time is it possible is there uh, uh, i think uh, i think there are uh, so many algorithms okay one one uh, thing i can mention rajeshree that is the Uh, you can say with the big data analytics okay big data definitely it deals with the data but there are algorithms there are methodologies by which you can identify rather you can uh, statistically gather data huge mass mass of data using this uh, data analytics technology data mining technology to identify how much uh, um, what amount of data are fake what amount of data is Uh, not fake rather uh, pure data okay that the methodology you can uh, you can apply to identify the ratio of fake news item or data or the true item or data okay after that you can devise some methodology definitely actually uh, what the uh, cyber cell is doing they are using the alpha, uh, algorithms okay to identify identify some crimes or criminals okay so they are using the same methodology that can be devised to identify the fake items for the site image sector it is very much possible and definitely use of artificial intelligence can help uh, in a bigger manner rather okay thank you sir what to you amrita please take over thank you sir okay thank you everybody for your patience hearing patience hearing okay so thank you, thank you again for the authority and your um, you amrita and rajeshree for my for this invitation thank you so i am leaving okay yes the next speaker for the day is dr vidyarthi dotto assistant professor department of library and information science vidyasagar university west bengal india He has published several papers in reputed journals and has spoken extensively on the topics of knowledge organization and metric analysis among others. His talk today is titled Digital Humanities as an Active Research Topic Today: Recent Trends and Developments. Dr. Dotto? Yes, hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay. Let me just present the screen. Very good afternoon to all of you, the organizing committee. My topic is digital humanities as an active research topic today. Recent trends and developments. Actually, I want to talk out. how the concept actually humanity humanities is a very old concept but exactly when and how the phrase digital was coupled with it now the first recorded article on digital humanities actually the term digital humanity was first used uh, in the year 2005 by sm kurtz and this was the article why technology matters the humanities in the 21st century it was published in interdisciplinary science reviews this was the first uh, recorded and formal use of the term digital humanities in the year 2005 now according to this article uh, 
computing and digitization are transforming not only the conditions of work for humanists but also the ways in which humanists think and their disciplines are configured actually the impact of digital media on human culture human heritage it is it was started just after the 2k and it is the first impact of the coinage of the turn so this was the concept actually first paragraph what i have written written here this is the crux concept lying behind the advent of the term the digital human is but next the digital world but actually in this way this term was first used in that article the third part actually is an uh, exact excerpt from that article and the indeed the most interesting thing about the new digital humanities environment may be that the distinction between teaching and scholarship is itself being eroded the database is fast becoming the principal site of work in the humanities now the second one the second article in 2005 only one article was found on digital humanities and the second was is published in the next year uh, entitled all in a day's work advancing data intensive research with the data capacity and this article actually presented a case study of indiana university which provided powerful compute storage and network resources to a diverse local and national research community and this paper mentioned that indiana university's facilities have been used to support data intensive applications ranging from digital humanities to computational biology actually so the, these phases digital humanity and computational biology these phases this phase was used to indicate a wide range of knowledge this is very interesting to notice and one another point to be noted that just after one year of the coinage of the concept one research project on digital humanities was started and the third paper it was published in the again in the next year in 2007 by warwick teres uh it was entitled as evaluating digital humanities resources the lyra project checklist and the internet shakespeare editions project actually they worked on the online version of shakespeare's work and it was this paper also presented another case study it actually described the project lyra project that assess the digital resource for humanities scholarship and it evaluated the internet shakespeare's editions website the full form of lyra was log analysis of internet resources in the arts and humanities and this project was based in the school of library archives and information studies and it was a 15 months project and the research objectives of this project was to determine the scale of use a neglect of digital resources in the humanities and to determine whether the resources that are used share any common characteristics actually the uh, focal point of this project was project was how the information resources are used in the particularly online or digital information resources are used in the domains of culture and heritage humanities culture and heritage this was the focal point of this project. this project highlighted the areas of good practice as well as aspects of project design that might be improved to aid greater use and sustainability a further aim was to determine whether digital resources that were neglected the effect of institutional and disciplinary culture in the construction of digital humanities project was also significant according to this paper now uh, let us analyze the let us see the highly cited 
artichokes and this is the new varieties. Actually, um, let me see. This is the mode of growth of literature in the subject of digital humanities. And here, if you look at this point, and this is this was made on the basis of Scopus database. Actually, uh, of the three databases, three bibliographic databases, Scopus, Web of Science, and Dimension. Uh, the largest number of uh, digital humanities research articles were found indexed in Scopus. And Scopus database recorded the first article published on digital humanities in 2005. And the growth started since after 2014. Particularly, uh, if you look at here, in 2005, only one article was published. In 2006, one. Up to 2010, the term was very freely accepted. But since after, in 2013 and 14, a huge hype. And since after that, since after 2014, during last five years, and if you see the percentage, almost 75% were 75% of articles, of total number of articles were published during the last 5-6 years, since 2014 to 20. And this is the growth curve. And this growth curve clearly indicates this is an emerging subject and this is a budding subject continuously growing. So this is the tendency of growth of literature. And of these, In all, around 1,800 papers we found indexed in Scopus, ranging from 2005 to 2020. And of this, this was the top cited paper, rank one, entitled Big Data, New Epistemologies and Paradigm Six. It was published in Big Data and Society. And uh, in the year 2014, it came. And it was cited 1980 times. According to Google Scholar, it's very famous. It is actually one of the citation classics in the area of digital humanities. And it was cited 882 times according to Scopus. Now, this article examines how the availability of big data coupled with new data analytics challenges established epistemologies across the science, social science, and humanities, and assesses the extent to which they are engendering paradigm shifts across multiple disciplines. Actually, the very title of this data suggests an interesting thing. In the year 2005-2006, when the concept uh, digital humanity was just Sprouted, then the flux concepts involved within this topic were mainly humanities and culture and heritage. But as time passed, the concepts like data analytics, big data, these types of things gradually came into being and included within this subject domain. And so the paradigm seeks. Actually, it is also interesting, the subject, the concept was first evolved in the year 2005, but during last six, seven years, the context of this concept is continuously changing. Actually, the focal points of this subject uh, digital humanities is continuously changing and even we don't, don't know in near future what will be the probable locus of the subject. That is the point. So this may be another active research topic today to find out the probable future locus of the subject in near future. Now, this article examines how the availability of big data coupled with new data analytics challenges established epistemologies across the sciences, social science, and humanities, and assess the extent to which they are engendering paradigm shift. 
so the concept of data analytics was coupled with this digital humanity concept and it critically explored uh, new forms of empiricism that declared the end of the theory and the creation of data driven rather than knowledge driven science end of the theory this is also another very important point particularly uh, in the context of social science the role of theory in social sciences were questioned since long because since the 1950s 1960s and we know robert k martin was an expert in this field he was known as the father of sociology of science we know and robert k martin started the debate and is there any need of theory whether theory is needed so theory or empiricism so what is the final answer in case of social science this is a very old question but the role of theory started to become questioned in some areas of pure sciences also that was the point particularly the role of theory was uh, dominating and role of theory was stronger in the field of science compared to social science but that still became questionable since after uh, 2013 or 14 and the way also hit the subject areas like digital humanities or these kinds of new interdisciplinary domains so whether there is end of theory and the creation of data driven or that is whether we will rely on theory or should we rely on data and knowledge and the development of digital humanities and computational social sciences that propose radically different ways to make sense of culture history economy and society what is today we are doing we do emotional analysis we do sentimental analysis in the uh, twitters in the facebook in the social networking sites by applying algorithms by applying different computational techniques so these are the applications to it next high cited paper second rank uh, entitled uh, towards the sociology of computational and algorithmic journalism it was actually here uh, in this article the digital humanity was discussed in the context of journalism uh, it was uh, cited 357 times according to google scholar and 157 times according to scopus now this article advances the sociological approach to computational journalism now by computational journalism this article refers to the increasingly ubiquitous forms of algorithmic social scientific and mathematical forms of news work adopted by many 21st century newsrooms and touted by many educational institutions as the future of news actually this paper indicated the changing or paradigm shift of news media or news journalism now by sociological approach this article embodies the research model that bracketed at least temporarily many of the current industry concerns with the practical usability of newsroom analysis next the third rank paper according to number of citations entitled uh, programmed methods developing a tool set for capturing and analyzing tweets it analyzes tweets this paper was cited Uh, 128 times according to google scholar and uh, 305 times according to scopus now this paper introduces digital methods initiative uh, twitter capture and analysis tool set this is the name of the tool set which is a tool set for capturing and analyzing twitter data this paper actually was the forerunner of uh application of quantitative technique to carry out emotion and sentimental analysis in social media that is frequently done today now the authors aim that uh, situating the development of the tool set in relation to methodological debates in the social science and humanities and this paper opened up critical debate by connecting 
uh, tool design to fundamental interrogations of methodology and gives repercussions for the production of knowledge. Now, let us uh, briefly highlight the citation statistics. The total number of articles as recorded by Scopus in the area of digital humanities since 2005 to 2020 figured 1825, of which 1084 articles were cited. That is 59.4, uh, almost 60% articles were cited, but number of uncited articles was 741. 40% articles are uncited. And of these 10, 84 cited articles, number of ONZ's articles, ONZ's means uh, cited only once, number of ONZ's articles were 331, 30.5%, number of twice's articles were 205, 11%, and uh, number of thrices, thrice cited articles were 139, 12.8%. So, uh, considering together, once is thrices and thrices as low cited articles, it is found that 62% articles are low cited, and all remaining articles are medium cited, and only three articles found cited more than 100 times which has a very important implication that as the percentage of low cited article is quite large, still number of uncited article is quite large as those articles uh, it is expected will be cited time to time as this is a budding subject domain. Hence the citation scattering is quite high in this area as low citation or tail citation zone low citation is quite high and which indicates high interdisciplinary nature of the domain that is frequently cited by the sources from diverse subject domains. Actually, uh, the articles published in the digital humanities areas, they receive citations from various subject domains and let us just look at here. This is the um, subject domain analysis, subject domain associated. And here we have found that the highest subject domain associated, highest percentage of subject domain associated with this digital humanities domain is computer science. We got 32% followed by social science, 26% uh, and arts and humanities 20%. Hence, 30, 20 means 50 and 25, 75. Hence, the digital humanities field, it is an interdisciplinary field, but still principally dominated by computer science, social science, and arts and humanities. And as we know, <coughs> sorry, social science itself is a highly interdisciplinary domain. And in this subject, computer science is actually used as a tool subject, whereas application area, area of applications are social science and arts and humanities. Also, percentage of involvement of mathematics is also quite high, uh, more than 6%, 6.5%. Because uh, if there is computer science, there are algorithms and there uh, must be mathematics also. So, this is the feature. There are other subjects also, engineering, business and sciences, etc. This is given here, medical science, business management, even art and planetary science, and, there, and these are others. Within others, the major subject disciplines are environmental science, one is. So, these are the things. Therefore, from this subject domain analysis, it is clear that this is a highly interdisciplinary subject domain. And the interdisciplinary nature is also clear from another feature. Out of the total number of publications, more than 1800 publications, it is found the number of articles figured only 911 and number of conference papers 850. That is number of articles and number of conference papers almost equal. And number of articles is so little, less than 50%. And number of conference papers is so high. 
followed by refuse with chapter 6 etc so these are negligible but very large number of conference paper a large percentage of conference papers uh, definitely indicates the nature of primary stage of the subject this subject is yet developing and sprouting and so the as conference papers we know these are primary documents so this subject is still chiefly dominated by primary sources of information and secondary sources are still coming and very little hence information is generated continuously generated in the subject domain which are waiting to be consolidated and repackaged again and again therefore this is a budding subject area and it may be asserted that there are huge scopes of research in different arenas of this subject domain so this is all thank you so much Thank you, sir. Uh, may I ask anyone uh, if anyone has any question? They may unmute themselves and gently ask. Um. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, Thank for you. such a bird's eye view of the umbrella term that is digital humanities. If you remember that the humanities have their roots in the denying of the enlightenment, and that the critical faculty is the cradle. Now we can safely assume that digital humanities would also carry forward this legacy of critical analysis, even for digital yes. or everything else, has a significant impact on the society in a nutshell. But yes, sir, the the way the particular metrical way you have looked at the this uh, research. Output and the uh, overall uh, growth in uh, academic terms of digital humanity that is uh, wonderful actually. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, sir, now please, uh, our next speaker is also in the in here, so we may move on to. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker for the day is Dr. Shushmita Das. Dr. Das has been working at the Agricultural Information Center of Bangladesh Agricultural Research Council, Dhaka, under Ministry of Agriculture since 2005. Her research focuses on the use of ICT development in the agricultural production system and overall livelihood of the rural of rural Bangladesh. She is the Vice President of the Center for Open Knowledge Bangladesh and works on agricultural information management, rural advisory services in Bangladesh, open access, open data, open science, etc. We are honored to have you with us today, ma'am. Kindly initiate a session, ma'am. <laughs> Dr. Das. Dr. Das, you've muted yourself. Dr. Das, can you hear me? Uh, uh, Miss Amita Mitra, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You're audible, oh. ma'am. Oh, sorry. I... Maybe some problem, right, sir? Yes. 
I think it is uh, morning or afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome my presentation. And before starting, I must uh, convey my sincere gratitude and thanks to the organizing committee and especially to the convener of this uh, international uh, conference, Mr. Rajesh Shiri Dash, and also one of the advisor, uh, Dr. Onup Dash, for inviting me as inviting me as a speaker. Indeed, it is an pleasure in uh, introduce uh, myself with this very large society. And my name is Shushmita Dash, and I'm working Malaysia Culture Research Council as principal deputation officer. And um, my presentation is augmented reality in, and library potentiality. So let me share my presentation. Your screen is not shared, man. Okay, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you I and we can also see the presentation. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, this is my presentation, Augmented Reality Technology and Potential Future Application in Library. And in the real world and virtual world. So we know Augmented Reality is a live data integrated view of a physical real world environment whose elements are augmented by computer generated sensory inputs as a sound, video, graphics, or GPS data. And it allows to indicate the real world and the virtual world and present information in different devices like mobile and daily correspondence to the physical environment. And you can select in filtering, visualizing virtual object context based information can be displayed together with real world object. And virtual reality or augmented reality is, a, we know, is a phenomenon that has been in a verifying course stages for years. In the case of VR, decades uh, as far back as the 1930s. But today, with a headset available to some and a handheld device available to many, it benefits live users who are fully expecting such end services in the future to include free or air. And we know technology that allows a person to interact with virtual objects overlaid on real time images, a form of virtual reality technology where computer generated images are superimposed upon physical environments by means of a film device. It is also abbreviated as augmented reality, commonly abbreviated as AR. The term referred to is simulated but enhanced reality that combines both computer generated virtual and real world data to allow users to complete real time interaction with computer generated graphics, imaginary and object in a smooth way and with an illusion of these layers of information coexisting in the same space. And it is an important technologies that continue to evolve, grow, and interact, integrate into the lives of our live users. We can say VR is the immersion of user into completely simulated environment, while AR overlays digital information on the user's real-world environment. 
Many libraries have adopted both as educational and exploratory tools. Augmented reality adds digital elements to a live view opened by using the camera on a lens and the game Pokemon Go. Uh, it's a virtual reality implies a complete immersion experience that shards out the physical world. This is the virtual reality tip and augmented reality um, conception. And what is augmented reality in library? It is a new ground in the library field. And it is indicates 3D virtual object in a 3D real environment in real time, and also superimposed upon uh, composites with the real world. But the user can still see the real world. Therefore, they are supplements reality rather than completely replacing it, like virtual reality. It has come a long way from a science fiction concept. Con to relating to a science-based reality. It is a cutting edge technology that allows smart device users for a digital enhanced view of the real world. Libraries and institutions of memory have been challenged to find new forms of dialogue with their users and have turned to via technology to entertain and inform their audience. It is quoted from an Enzel Tick Tucky 2013. What is augmented reality in library? Again, I uh, am saying that a few prototype application exist that demonstrate the feasibility of augmented reality to support users and the staff of libraries. For example, the University of Applied Sciences post developed a concept and prototype for a complex AR based app by my library providing a additional information and reviews to media as well as genuine information about the library. And it is an image-based AR app for a mobile device and AR glasses that supports users on finding their way to desired book in the book set. Also, the Miami University in Oxford, Ohio developed an AR-based app called Sevlar that supports libraries to identify books in the wrong place and for inventory. The Babarian State Library Munich provides a location-based AR app that offers additional information to spatial location, buildings, and monuments related to King Ludwig. Although there exists a number of augmented reality applications specially designed for libraries, especially we can say for the users of libraries, their number is limited. None of them got ready for the market, and some of them, like, say, uh, uh, your slide is not. Continue. Continue. You can the slide is not moving, ma'am. Sorry? Your slide is not moving, ma'am. If it is meant to be that way, it's all right, but it's, your slide is not moving that I can see. Oh, slide is not uh, visible? No, it is visible, but it is not moving. It is on the title slide only. The next pages are not coming, or you maybe. Oh, okay, maybe <laughs> maybe the color is not. Oh, not a problem. Um, okay. Then what can I do now? <laughs> Sorry, maybe uh, it's color problem. I think. Don't worry. If it is not moving, you can talk and we can listen. That's uh, that's also a good experience. Okay, I I am send you later the the PPT. Okay, you can share with all the. Okay, thank you. And there are some uh, augmented reality application in libraries, and there are already exist a few AR application dedicated to the use in libraries. However, most of them are prototypes are especially designed for a certain library. Different types of AR application can be distinguished apps providing additional information on media for library users, including locating media in the library, apps supporting librarians, example, identifying books, apps providing additional information on culture asset associated with the library, archive, augmented books. This is augmenting books example, the, the Skylight project, a special collection using augmented reality 
to enhance learning and testing, developed a marker-based app using QR codes and book covers to support students that have to consult rare books, manuscripts, and archives within the control conditions of library reading rooms. The AR-based app enables students to experience the best of the real and the virtual world. Students can enjoy the sensory delights of seeing and handling original materials while enhancing their learning experience by enhancing the object with digital images, online learning resources, and information on the items before them and on related objects held in the library and elsewhere. Like in Skylight, markers can be embedded in various kinds of books, children books, educational books, magazines, or catalogs, thus allowing the reader to access additional information, access various multimedia content. And we know it is very uh, common and popular technology that is rapid radio frequency identification uses electromagnetic fields to automatically identify and track tracks attached to the object. Barcodes are also a very common and very popular pattern of bars and species of verifying within the different digits, letters, or other punctuation symbols to identify an item or object. And image recognition um, uh, for technology also now uh, it is very uh, popular. And do you know why people are getting more interested in augmented reality? And there's very popular example do you know iphone and android is the best example why people are very much interested in using this very uh, modern technology and this is the examples and augmented reality and virtual reality orasma it is an example of a free app that can download it to either on ios or android device and it is an easy to use an AR platform. It is very, it is uh, maybe introduced in 2014. And Google uh, Cardboard, it is now, it is, it is also very famous and using a combination of smartphone and simple viewer, the cardboard, uh, cardboard headset allows patterns to experience a multitude or layer level VR application. While not comprehensive, it does offer a taste of the virtual experience. And do we need to these things to be considered while we are thinking for our library VR and their applications can be implemented in all types of libraries. If you are considering starting a program, keep in mind the following things. First of all, budget option that can provide a variety of different experiences are available for libraries uh, on a tight budget. And you have to consider uh, about space also when selecting hardware you will need to know whether you will have a dedicated space within the library or will be restricted to mobile devices user base there are many types of vr and ar experiences and libraries to decide wh which ones they want to provide before making any purchasing decisions would your users like an immersive experience or an augmented experience that incorporates their real surroundings. Staffing options, make sure that there is enthusiasm among your staff members for specific devices as they will require some form of tech support. If there is not mass interest, it could be difficult to get any sort of program started. Have an open mind, explore all the inter Testing applications that are available, certain applications are available on some, but not all platforms. Examples include the Steam platform, the Oculus Store, iOS and Android app stores, and the HTC Vive code determining whether certain games are available for your platform can help in deciding which devices to invest in. And this is the concluding remarks for my side. Libraries have to change in signal signal files with the latest technologies and help for support the information and knowledge seeker. For these librarians need to completely update themselves with the changing technologies and become the leaders in sharing the data and information for the knowledge. And by incorporating VR and AR devices and programs, libraries can offer access to these technologies and create unique learning and experiment 
mental opportunities for the teachers. And this is uh, my brief presentation. I am very much sorry that you are not able to see my presentation. And I'll uh, send it to my, the organizing committee uh, so that they can share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, I just received one question though. Uh, am I audible? Can you hear me, Shushmita? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just I have this question that uh, how do you think this AR or VR technology that you are talking about, uh, how do you think that it will be cost effective to be used in the you know, academic setting or even in the public library for that matter? Do you think uh, it will be cost effective or economical to use in, a, in a, our context? Our context are both are the same almost, Bangladesh and India, third world countries, global south. So what is your opinion on that? Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, who who raised this question? I can. Uh, Some students. Uh, I know earlier. Sorry, I cannot read your name. Uh, thank you very much, anyway. And this is actually my question also. It is the uh, things uh, how we can implement this uh, very. Uh, you can say it is more. Uh, not cost effective, but nowadays, uh, both Bangladesh and India, as I know, my government is also very much uh, technology friendly. And if we, uh, librarians and information managers, can prove that it is very much effective for the user and knowledge sharing, I think budget and uh, they can uh, give you budget for. Um, implementing these technologies but uh, but the uh, 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 academic library it is um, uh, not uh, for all but you can uh, uh, take some uh, short technology this is not the most costly so that time actually not cost effective but if we want to manage our authority we can uh, implement this technology i think Thank you. If you have any questions, so please go ahead. It's, a, it's also a humanity. Yes. I don't have any questions at present. I think ma'am will share her uh, presentation with us, which I think will give us a better idea about a very uh, relatively newer topic. Uh, to people who are not uh, directly, uh, you know, connected with, with library sciences. Thank you, ma'am, for that very interesting, very enriching session. I think Rajushida, now we can mm -hmm. talk to the presenters. Yeah, I have a video recording of a presenter. I will share it from here only, and afterwards, if there are any presenters here on the chat box, we can also. Shall I call out a few names so that they know that they have to present? <laughs> you may do that. I. Yeah. I while I organize this. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, Sir. Sash. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, can I uh, can I present my presentation, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, you, you can go ahead. Yes. I think you're Amita, right? Yes, yes, of course, no problem. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. I can't share my screen. Why not? Wait, 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 wait. I'm doing that. Yes, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir.
if it is not pre being presented you can start talking you know yes sir i have a problem presenting some network issues is it visible sir it is going to be uh, you open yes. up the ppt yes sir it will eventually be visible yeah the visible yeah the screen is visible okay you okay start opening the ppt yes okay thank you sir um uh, good good afternoon to all of you uh, respected sir and ma'am my name is santosh kumar kanojia uh, i am the research scholar from uh, uh mahatma gandhi central initiative motihari bihar uh, uh today's my topic is uh, impact of uh, uh, impact of web 2.0 uh, on uh, on libraries yes sir uh this is my uh, out so my screen is uh, moving hello we cannot see your presentation can you click on the presentation we can see the screen so my screen yeah. uh, my screen is visible your screen is visible your presentation is not oh can you click on the presentation so i have a problem and uh, then please tell us uh, you know and we verbally the subject matter so can i later some some later sir so i have some problems facing some problems sir okay i will but you should you should should i go ahead and uh, yeah the, you you uh, you just start verbally as the madam suggested santosh yes sir you start talking about the subject matter and come to the conclusion that yes sir would, that would do yeah yes sir and you can send us the ppt afterwards in the meeting yes sir okay uh, talking <clears throat> about your yeah problem yes sir uh, my topic is the uh, impact of library uh, impact of web 2.0 on libraries uh, the concept is a uh, web 2.0 refers to the way web web 2.0 where refers to website the emphasize user generated content is of use participatory uh, participatory culture and interoperability or uh, interoperability for a uh, use for in users uh, examples uh, example uh, compatible with other product system and devices web 2.0 can be described uh, in three parts uh, first is a rich rich web applications defines uh, it, it defines the experience brought from desktop browsers whether it is a rich from a graphical point of view or a usability interval interactivity or features point of view second is a uh, web oriented architecture uh, it is uh, it defines how web 2.0 applications expose their functionality so that other applications can leverage and integrate the functionality providing a set of much richer applications example arthur speed web services mashups etc uh, next is this is the client and server based hello hello am audible sir go ahead go ahead am audible sir Yes, you are very much audible. Please go ahead. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. 
This is the client and server based network protocols as much as Wave 2.0 draws together the capabilities of client and server side software, content syndication, and the use of network protocols. Standard oriented web browsers may use plugins and software extensions to handle the content and user interactions. Uh, next is uh, Web 2.0 sites provide users with information storage, creation, and dissemination capabilities uh, that were not possible in the environment known, known as uh, Web, web 1.0. The term Web 2.0 was officially coined in 2004 by Dell Daughtry during a team discussion on a, on a feature conference about the Web, web uh, team or really. Uh, 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 it is the background of the Web 2.0 is the Web 1.0 is a retronym uh, referring to the first stage of the World Wide Web and evolution from roughly 1991 to 2004, according to Comrade and Krishnamurti, content creator were few in Web 1.0 with the vast majority of users simply acting as consumers of content. There's some uh, examples of Web 1.0 and between the uh, difference between the Web 1.0 and Web 1.2.0. Next is a... Uh, uh, some uh, Web 2.0 capabilities were present in the days of Web 1.0, but were implemented differently. For example, a Web 1.0 site may have added a guestbook uh, page for visitor comments instead of a comment section at the end of the each pages. Uh, during Web uh, 1.0, server perform performance and bandwidth had to be considered lengthy. Uh, lengthy co comment threads on multiple pages could uh, potentially slow down. Uh, an entire site, Terry Flew, uh, Terry Flew, uh, in, his, in his third edition of New Media, uh, a book name is New Media, explained the difference between one point, Wave 1.0 and Wave 1.2.0 as a. Mm. He said, uh, move from personal website to blogs and blog site, uh, blog site aggregation uh, from publishing to participation from web content as the outcome of large upfront investment to an ongoing and interactive process and from content management system to link based on tagging website content using keywords foxonomy. Uh, Flew uh, believe these uh, uh, factors form the trend that resulted in the uh, onset of the Web 2.0 craze. Introduction. So, uh, the World Wide Web has the uh, economy WWW has undergone under radical transformation over the past years due to the integration of social wave web application and, te and technology. A new web environment came into existence that called Web 2.0. Uh, I understand this formula that uh, so social wave plus web application plus technology is called uh, Web, web 2.0. It is the creation of the, it is, uh, that's why create created the Web 2.0 as the latest and technology to such was accelerating information informative and dramatically changed the way people look for information just ask for a librarian a record 6 billion researches were conducted on the search engines in january 2007 definitions definitions is a uh, to web 2.0 is the term web 2.0 web 2.0 officially coined into uh, coined in 2004 by del dot dory during a team discussion on a potential future conference about the web, uh, web orally to for the it has brought a dramatic change in the use of the internet, uh, internet and offer offers us uh, several tools and services that allow is uh, uh, interactions and participation to all users. That the orally to observe that the changes change in the web environment has over evolved personal uh, web pages web pages into blogs, encyclopedia, into uh, Wikipedia, text-based tutorials into the streaming media applications. Continue. Uh, it is to continue. Uh, the principles of Web 2.0 are also applicable to libraries, and this new scenario is playing a role of, uh, in changing the behavior of providers, the users' information. Librarians and information professionals need to consider the new new mindset of users and transform their library and information services according, accordingly. With the advent of the Web 2.0 is here. Users can do a lot 
uh, let for library such as creating additional information and content and generating knowledge. Uh, that's the benefits of Web 2.0 in environment can be considered reciprocal. The these two examples show these cultural changes. First is a uh, Library of Congress offers opportunity to users uh, to tag these type photos uh, through Flickr. Library of Congress. Uh, uh, second is the uh, the scientists have suggested the Wikify if the researchers discover inaccuracies in the database. They should be allowed to uh, append corrections. Miranda uh, uh, says the says by Miranda Glat Glatius and Cocasia 2009. Features of Web 2.0. The features of Web 2.0 are Andrew McAfee 2006 and 2006 used the acronym SLATES to represent the Web 2.0 features. First is search. Uh, <clears throat> first is search. The, the, the ease of finding information through keywords such that platform available. Uh, it, uh, it means uh, uh, it means uh, um, McAfee uh, says that the search is uh, the uh, searching by the keywords uh, available keywords in the uh, search engines. The second is links. Guide to important pieces of information. The best web pages are are the most frequently linked to. Third is authoring. The ability to create constantly up updating content over a platform that is shifted from being the creation of a few to being the constantly updated inter interlinked work. Third is uh, next is text. Uh, categorization of content by it, uh, creating tags that are simple one word descriptions to facilitate searching and avoid rigid pre made category. Uh, so, uh, next is extension automation of the sum of the work and patterns matching by using algorithms, example, Amazon.com recommendations. Uh, next is signals in RSS, uh, users are notified about any change in the content through email. Conclusions. That the conclusion is uh, uh, libraries uh, libraries uh, have skills with professional expertise that have, that can be leveraged to raise the challenge of few uh, of web 2.0 not only in collection and preservation but also in the users to center services they are also the guardians of a long tradition of a public service uh, ethic which will increasingly need to deal with the privacy and legal issues uh, raised by the web 2.0 Library staff should encourage in thinking and acting pro uh, proactively, uh, proactively about, about how they can bring this to the this to bear on the development if it, if, the, if new library and information services based technologies. Thanking, thank you, sir. Thank you, Shantosh. I just missed that part. I am wondering what did you mention about the basic difference of Web 1.0 and 2. Web 2.0? In one sentence, the basic difference, which has been the game changer. Yes, sir. What do you think? What do you think? What is that? What is that basic changes that has occurred in Web 2.0? It was not there in the earlier version, Web 1.0. What was that basic one sentence? Uh, uh, sir, uh, today's the uh, social medias are run on the 2.0 uh, Web 2.0s. Uh, it is the it is a tool. Uh, Web 2.0 is a, it is a tool that run on the uh, social medias, uh, uh, YouTube, uh, uh, Facebook, mm. Flickr, uh, Instagram, it is these are. Okay, mm. you're right. Uh, but the, actually, what social media even do? <laughs> My question was that only. Actually, you're absolutely right on that part. Social media is the, you know, the, 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 the true expression of 2.0. Now, what social media does? Social media, what social media do is it, uh, uh, it allows interactivity. In earlier version, the blog that you mentioned, blog in other websites, one doesn't have this one uh, to one, one to many communication. Eight, two point you have to, zero, yes, uh, uh, yes, you uh, have to send a mail to the web admin and wait for the reply. But in a web 2.0, the social media things came into being and the interactivity, the democratization of information exchanges took place. Anyways, thank you so much. Um, and can you just one more uh, a question? Can you just tell me uh, what is the reflection of web 2.0 in the library parlance or in the library setting uh, for that matter? What? So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so library. Uh, Web 2.0 uh, impact the uh, library in the automation for and uh, in the field of automation, OPEX, ETCs are. 
No, no, no. Automation was from earlier. From the web what was it? There was the cases of automation happening in the neighboring institutions. Let me tell you. Uh, you you notice that ask the librarian feature in any website, in a, in a, in a library website or the academic uh, institutions website. The ask the librarian feature. The ask the librarian feature is a is a is a throwback from the earlier web 1.0 age. Now it has moved to a librarian's Facebook page where 24 seven interaction is possible. Now as the librarian is a pretty good, yes, pretty sir. old version where yes. it, it may sound, uh, you know, sounds fantastic, but it's a throwback from the old day time. It's, a, it's as good as sending a mail to someone and wait for the reply. Do not know if and that is seen or not. So uh, the Facebook pages of many institutions or uh, is the, you know, the hallmark feature of web 2.0 in library, in institutional uh, paradigm. Thank you so much, Santosh. Uh, okay. Is there anybody else who would like to present their case in the Thank you, conference? Thank you. Or should I play the video that I had obtained? I think I'd share the video that uh, one presenters sent across. Hello, uh, everyone. I am Julie. Is a is a is a is it visible? Is a video playing nicely? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please confirm, uh, Amita, once. Yes, yes. Hello, yes, fine. Okay. I am Julie Thakuria, research scholar in the Department of Library Information Science, Assam University. And my guide, Professor Manas Kumar Sinha, Dean, Swami Vivekananda School of Library Information Science and head of the Department, Library Information Science, Assam University. We are jointly prepared this paper, Trends and Development of Green Library, a study. The basic introduction, the rapid growth of information and communication technology and its uses release greenhouse gases, mainly the carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. The libraries are transforming to green libraries by building the green library building for sustainability. They also transform the existing library services facilities into green services and promote to eco-friendly environment inside the library. While going green, the three categories of benefit are evolved. That is, economy, health, and environmental benefit. Purpose of the study. The green library is a new concept. It is gaining popularity among the library professionals. It encourages the future allies professionals to think about going green and environmental sustainability. The paper described the concept of green library its importance, different standards for green libraries, green library initiatives in India and abroad. It also explained the strategies and method of adopting green research in the inside the library. And what do we know about green library? According to New World Encyclopedia defines green library, also known as sustainable library, is a library built with environmental concerns in mind. Green libraries are a part of the larger green building movement. Libraries are not only collection of resources, but are also important information resources for raising awareness about environmental concerns. According to online dictionary of library and information science, defines green library or sustainable libraries as a library designed to minimize negative impact on the natural environment and maximize indoor environmental quality by means of careful site selection, use of natural construction materials and biodegradable products, conservation of resources like water, energy, paper, and responsible waste disposal, recycle, etc. Green libraries educate the public about environmental issues through their collections, sustainable and environmentally friendly facilities. 
need of the twin libraries. Libraries are not only repositories of knowledge, but are also important information resources to educate its users awareness about environmental concern. The importance of green libraries are the green library building produce less gas emission and consume less electricity than other buildings. Building with green roof make it attractive and also absorb rainwater leads to less heat. Use of renewable energy reduce energy consumption and helps in safe money. Green libraries helps to prevent air pollutant, makes the clean air and healthy environment inside the library. Paperless environment that is going digital saves the tree and also save the environment. Standards for green libraries. Indian Green Building Council. It is established in the year 2001 to promote and rate green building in India. The rating system are voluntary and based on the five elements of the nature. Green rating for integrated habitat assessment. Terry, the Energy and Resource Institute, New Delhi, is another organization that is in forefront of the green building movement in India. Terry founded Griha, Green Rating for Integrated Habitat Assessment, for rating of green building in India in 2015. Then Habitat Technology Group, 1987. It is a non-governmental organization and is totally committed to the concept of green and human architecture. It has been accepted as a model agency to carry out green building in Kerala in 1987. Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It is a rating system in international level. The six credit categories for new building construction are sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, material and resources, indoor environmental quality, and innovation in design. The lead rate on 100 points and are certified the building in the four categories that is 25 to 40 point as certified, 41 to 50 points as silver, 51 to 60 points as gold, and 61 to 80 points as platinum. And last one is building research establishment environmental assessment method. It is the leading and most widely used environmental assessment method for building at international level. It sets the standards for best practice in sustainable design and enables a building's environmental performance to be measured. Strategies and methods for greening the building. The first one is the reading room should be situated with natural daylight design. The reading room, uh, while designing the reading room, uh, it is kept in mind that the natural day daylight should be easily come to the uh, room. Use biodegradable material for library equipments. Use energy saving light that is CFL or LED light use. Maximum use of solar energy. Subscribe electronic resources. Purchase eco-friendly version of computer. Use laptop instead of desktop because desktop consumes more energy. Send email instead of paper, rooftop planting, maximum use of bamboo instead of steel. In these are easily degradable bamboo. Use of bilevel switching, provision of RAM or physically uh, physically unable person actually provision of audio guidance for hearing. Um, in provision of audio guidance for uh, physically silenced person. Then green library initiatives in international perspectives. Thomas Golisano Library at Robert Wilson College. This is the first academic library building to achieve lead silver certification. It uses various methods to more it more energy efficient. 
Baitu's Green Library. It is East Asia's most eco-friendly building. The library's large windows help the electricity use. Brington's Jubilee Library, UK. It is the winner of multiple building awards, including a Green Excellent rating. Solar and wind, wind energy are used to heat and cool the building naturally. Amsterdam Public Library. It is the most sustainable building in Amsterdam based on green method. Hetty Hille Public Library. It has earned many certificates. It has green roofing and uh, reduced air temperature. Roof water harvested. Natural lights have been used for public areas. National Library Singapore. National Library Singapore is known as greatest building on the planet and uses light self allowing light to filter into the library. Then Seattle Central Library 2004. It is located in dense public area to reduce cost of transportation, use of triple uh, gas glasses, reduces heat saving energy. Then Green Library Initiatives in India, Anna Sanitary Library, it is the first green building in India. The building received the LEED and C Gold rating from Indian Green Building Council in 2010. It is designed in such a way that the reading area received good daylight. Karnataka University Library. Karnataka University Library adopted some green measures like there is no bookshelf inside the library and there is no chairs or tables. Uh, but benches are installed under the trees. Parma Karpo Library, it is designed for a small village in Ladakh. The ventilated trombo walls, uh, wool insulation, mud roof, and sonal panels on the roof are the green measures adopted in the library. Like that, Delhi University Library, Calcutta University Library, Madras University Library, Mumbai University Library also adopting green measures like windows are large and too many accelerating both fresh air and sunlight, fast open area, thick walls, etc. The Mumbai University Library building is the heritage building with a height of 280 feet and wooden material mainly used. Last one is National Institute of Technology Silser. It is the first green building in entire Northeast region. The new library building under construction and it is designed according to the LEED certification system of US. And I want to conclude my paper. Green library or sustainable library helps in reducing carbon footprints, minimize waste generated and reduce inputs. Green building has very important role in the environmental protection. It is the duty of the librarian to motivate their patron to adopt green technology and should play a role of leader to construct or convert the library into green library. It will help to save the money and attract the user. Thank you all. So now I shall uh, read out the names in the list. If the individual is present, then kindly unmute yourself and present your paper. Okay. The first name is Ashok Kumar. Ashok Kumar. Bipin Chandrapant. G. S. Morali. Gyanendra Kumar. J. Kiran. Koti Thavamani, Kiran Kumar A.V., Krishnaraj S., Kuldeep P. Power, Loknath Paital, Manpreet Kaur, Mary Florence Radha, Mohammed Ismail, Mohammed Umar, Mom Chapter Padhai. If you are present, kindly unmute yourself 
and then you can present your ideas. Nagulesh, Nisha Joshi, P. Pratibha, Pankat Singh, P. Mukherjee, Prema, R. Rajendran, Ramachandran Ji. If you are present, kindly unmute yourself and share your ideas with us. S. Sangameshwaram. S. Vasundhara. Sahil Bains. Saktival R. Shomit Chandra Dash. Uh, Satuluri Chenna Chenaya Sujitra Patil Shrijita Shubir Dash Shushma R. Mavande Yogamina A. and Yavesh Kavale Are any of these participants present? I don't think so. All right. Pradeshita, should we break for lunch then? Yes, yes, please. Okay. So with this, we come to the end of the first session of day two. The stimulating lectures and discussions have indeed been an exceptional intellectual experience. We would like to thank all our speakers and presenters for introducing us to newer perceptions of digital humanities and our participants for their heartfelt cooperation. We now break for lunch and all participants are requested to join the meeting once again at 1.50 p.m. The second session of ELAN 2021 shall begin at 2 Please join 10 minutes prior to the commencement of the session. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Ma'am? Yes? Ma'am, feedback link for session one? That will be shared at the end of the day. Okay, okay. Mom, you sharing feedback one or two? We'll be sharing only one link for every day. So we send one link uh, yesterday and the other link will follow for today at the end of the whole program. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All too. right. Please join us at 2 p.m. once again, 10 minutes prior. Thank you and have a great day. Ma'am. Yes. I cannot talk to English. Ki bolte chao bolo. They just left
experience.
Rashida, am I audible? Yes, yes, Tony. Yes, uh, may I start? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to uh, second session of uh, today's program. And uh, this program is on uh, in is on. A library and allied subject in network organized by Central Library of Banwarilal Bhalotia College, Asansol, West Bengal, under the aegis of IQAC uh, and in collaboration with DHIDRP, Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur. I, on behalf of Banwarilal Bhalotia College, extend my welcome to all resource person participants who are all gathered here to add radiance to this program. Now, uh, in last uh, session, in paper presentation, our two presenters was unable to present their presentation due to some network problem, and they sent their uh, presentation. Uh, so now, uh, first, we are going to present their uh, presentation. And uh, after that, we uh, so we start the keynote speech at sharp 2 p.m. Be with us. Is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sahil. I am a student of Kingston Gandhi National Open University. The title of my study is Universe of Social right? Media Platforms in Pedagogical Settings. My PPT is divided into certain contents. It contains introduction, objectives, research methodology, findings, and conclusion. Introduction. Social media are the interactive applications and websites that permit the users to generate and share content in the form of ideas, interests, via virtual networks. The web-based applications providing essential social media services can be run on digital devices like smartphones, tablets, laptops, etc. Social media has gained a widespread recognition over the past years as an effective way of communication and information dissemination. According to Cambridge Dictionary, social media is defined as websites and computer programs that allow people to communicate and share information on the internet using a computer or mobile phone. Objectives. Social media is an indispensable tool for communication and sharing of files in the network in the network environment. It becomes important to know about the use of social media in pedagogical settings and to know about the student perception towards the them. The objectives of the study are to observe the usability of social media in academic activities of the students, to observe the problems faced by the students, and to analyze student satisfaction level with social media usage in their academics. Research method. In the present study, descriptive survey method of research is used. Simple random sampling technique was employed to collect the data from a sample of 132 students of University of Jammu. The data is collected online via Google Forms. Findings of the study. Distribution of the students based on their age and gender. Most of the students, that is 39.4%, belong to age group of 22 to 25 years. 27.3% students belong to 26 to 29 years. 21.2% belong to 18 to 21 years. And the rest, 12.1% students account for above 29 years of age. Out of total students, 57.6% are females and 42.4% are males. Social media applications used by the students. The different social media applications used by the students are WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, and YouTube. Uh, among these, WhatsApp and uh, Facebook are the most popular, including Instagram. Duration of using social media or educational motives. 
of our students have been using social media for 0 to 2 years, 24.2% for 2 to 4 years, 27.3% for 4 to 6 years, and 33.3% for more than 6 years. So, all of the students have been using social media in their uh, education motives and they are <coughs> very well aware of their use. Preference of using the particular platform. There are various factors when it comes to choosing a specific platform for sharing information or ideas. The students were asked about the same and the primary reasons for choosing a platform are ease of use, faster file sharing, friendly interface. The other contributing reasons are how rich a platform is because of its security and some of the reasons. Time spent on social media platforms. Most of the students, that is 45.4% use social media for average 2 to 4 hours a day, 21.2% use for 4 to 6 hours, 18.2% for 0 to 2 hours, and 15.2% for more than 6 hours pertaining to their education activities. Platforms suggested by the students to share and exchange educational information. WhatsApp is the most suggested app as it is recommended by more than half of the population, that is 54.5%. Uh, and the second most preferred app is Telegram. Educational purposes for using social media platform. The various purposes for which the students have been using social media to support their activities pertaining to education are to ask for information, text messaging, to share files, to ask for query, to get updates from your teachers, to attend seminars, to, and to attend online classes. Among, among these, the major factors that have come out are to share files and to get updates, including to ask the information. <laughs> students' perception on importance of social media. The students were asked how important they consider social media in their academics. And majority of the students, that is 78.8%, consider social media to be very important, 15.2% consider social media to be moderately important, and 6% are neutral. As we can see in this figure, that there is no such student who considers social media of no, no importance. That means every student gives some importance to social media. Problems faced by using, by using social media. The students have come across certain problems also, like uh, unstable network, too much messages, cost of internet packs, information and uh, anxiety, size of files, while 15.2% uh, of the app is no issues. Student satisfaction with the role of social media platforms in educational settings. Most of the students are satisfied as they have expressed their satisfaction on time four and five on a scale of one to five, while 12.1% are neutral, that is, they are neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. Conclusion Social media platforms have become an essential part of our lives. They facilitate communication as one can share messages, files, attend meetings, etc. WhatsApp has come out to be the mostly used app by the students, and majority of the population has been using such apps for academic purposes for more than six years. The usefulness of social media has found to be significant in academics as it will with the information provided by the students. The main reasons for use of social media are to share files and get updates from the teacher regarding different matters. These platforms have greatly helped the students with valuable information and in seminars and assignments at the same time. And they have also faced certain problems like unstable network, costly internet facts, information anxiety, etc. Being all the aspects related to social media, it can be seen that students are most satisfied with their role in pedagogical settings. So with this, I end my PPD. I thank you for giving me such an opportunity. Thanks. Next presentation would be by P. Pratibha.
Hello everyone, myself, Sri Pratima. Today yes, I will be it is okay. presenting my paper, Open Educational Resources. Yes, it is okay. Open Educational Resources is, it is a teaching learning material which we may use, freely use and reuse at no cost without needing any permissions. Unlike the copyrighted resources, OER, these open educational resources have been authored and created by the individual or by the any organizations which have limited, if any, ownership rights. It includes full courses, course material, modules, textbooks, training videos, tests, software, and any other tool materials uh, or techniques used to support the access and access. That this OER are first defined by UNESCO in 2000. This OER may be the condition based or freedom. When it is the condition, then it has the attribution, share alike, non commercial, and no more. And when it is the freedom, you can easily access. Copy, use, adapt, and easily we can share. This is the encompasses encompasses of tools, contents, resources. Tools. And this is the open open source software for development and delivery of resources. Contents. These materials published for learning and as well as other researchers. Resources. It has the licensing tools and inoperability. The origins of the OER, the first major product is by the MIT Open Course Project. In 2001, MIT initiated to publish university course for free public access for non-commercial use. As well as in the 2002, uh, it introduces the proof of concept in 50 courses uh, with materials uh, in 2014, it introduces about 2,150 courses and 125 million visitors into this world. And another is the 2007 Cape Town Open Education Intervention. This open education is not limited to just open educational resources. Uh, it also draws uh, upon open technologies which facilitate the collaborative, flexible learning and the open sharing of teaching practices which empower the educators to benefit from the best ideas of their colleagues. The five R's of OERs are reuse, revise, remix, redistribute, retire. Reuse, we use the content in its unaltered form as many times as we can use. Adapt, this can be adapted, adjusted, we can also modify, improve and alter the content. Remix, we can combine the original and revised content with OER to create something new. Redistribute, we can distribute the copies of the original content, revision, remixes with others. Retain, this can be retained or keep, uh, we can keep, uh, retain for the future. Keep access to the materials after the reading the event. It is a global movement. In China, materials from 750 courses made available by uh, 222 universities, members of the China Open Resources for Education Consortium. The uh, website related to this is the 4.org. And in the Japan, resources from more than 400 courses from 19 member universities of the Japanese OCW Consortium. In the France, it has the 800 educational resources from around the 1,000 teaching units at 11 member universities of the Paris Tech OCW project. In UK, Open University has released the distance learning materials via the Open Learning Project. Open 80 UK OER projects have been released with many resources. Uh, Africa, OER Africa, developing and disseminating OER for higher education is institution facilitate of health, intereducation, and agriculture. This OER in India is National OER Repository, which is maintained by the MHRT and NCRT, and all materials are CC by S. 
and NPTEL, National Program and Technology Enhancement Release Learning, release a content free and open under CC by SCLNC. It is the website related to Karnataka OER Wiki. Uh, this is the website. The ICT's uh, four chains are working with teachers to support understanding of OER developing lesson plans from state tests and release openly. And uh, like that, these are the national vision on education through ACR 280. And these all are the uh, different uh, tech, uh, programs using this OER technology. The benefits of the OER, it has the many benefits to students as well as the faculty, which reduces the students' cost. Instead of using the material and uh, for purchasing those, by using these OERs, uh, the student can use as many times as to, it reduces the cost of the purchase of the goods. Uh, according to the uh, according to a June 2013 government accountability report, textbook prices rose 82 percent between the 2002 and 2003, and three times of rate of inflation. Many students opting out of um, uh, buying the students instead of um, uh, uh, buying the students and other course materials due to the cost. The, uh, when we are using these OERs, it reducing or eliminating the cost of course materials. And another is the support to student success and retention. It can help guarantee that every student in course has access to course materials at the same time at the optimal time. Several studies indicate that access to these materials help students succeed in course and if they advance it towards the graduation. Innovative uh, teach, uh, your teaching practices. When we are adapting these OERs, it will be, you can create the OERs, which gives the faculty the opportunity to tailor the course content in new ways, allowing them to maximize the use of content to provide innovative and optimized learning experiences and environment for students. OER supports the open pedagogy and open education. Exercise your academic freedom. Okay, we can control the content, edit, revise, modify it as you like. Enrich the scholarship. Uh, it, uh, if faculty share the great, great lesson, simulation, tutorial, textbook, etc., it gives, it gives fellow instructions more options for their own teaching and learning. The more biological strategies available for teaching a topic, the stronger the teaching and learning can be. And also the other, uh, we can enjoy the administrative support. Okay, uh, the OER can have the challenges, understanding using licensing. Uh, not all uh, OERs are created equal. The most are associated with uh, one of these creative common licenses. Uh, we have to make sure to check the license. The most suitable OERs include CC by license, which simply requires the attribute the creators of the content. And another challenge of this is the quality. If it's free, how good can it be? Most OER repositories include peer reviews and rating systems, which can help to determine the quality of an open educational resources. And adapt, adopting and adapt. Thing OER will take time. We will need time to review the content and to uh, and to then either adapt your course to it or to adapt the OER to your course. If you are replacing the commercial textbook with OER, there will be a switching cost in terms of time. Lack of uh, ancillary constraint. It may be difficult to give up the commercial textbook. It is often accompanied by uh, by best test bands, slide decks, and other supplement materials for OER, which doesn't include the ancillary content. Accessibility. You will want to make sure that whatever OER you choose to use is accessible according to accessibility standards. UM Assessive Technology Services, ATS can assist.
okay these are the benefits and uh, challenges related to the open educational resources thank you presentation session and I throw up on the platform for keynote and invite to speak. Uh, I welcome Dr. Aim Kishamukhi sir for the session. Uh, uh, I would like to request the conversation to introduce her and start the session. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Rajushida. Uh, now let me allow to invite our first speaker of the session. Our first speaker is Dr. M. Krishnamurti, sir. Welcome to you, sir. He is the associate professor and head of Documentation Research and Training Center of Indian Statistical Institute of Bangalore. And he delivered lectures in multiple fora and published numerous paper in reputed, reputed journal. Over to you, sir. Thank you. You are audible, sir. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to present now. Okay. Can you see no? No, sir. Till now no. it is not visible. Okay, okay. Wait a minute. Select window screen. Not nothing. Okay, entire screen. Okay, now. I maximize your window. Yeah. Uh, now it is visible, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, sir. It's okay. Okay. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, thanks to organizing committee members, especially Rajasi Das and uh, Chandip Das, Das organizing committee members, who invited me to talk on the library landscapes, digital developments, and society change. Uh, friends, uh, we are in the um, information society. We are in the knowledge society. We are living in the knowledge economy. So information rides our lives. We depend on information to perform effectively. For people, information serves to sustain our mental activity just as food and drink sustain our bodies. Like information is also the fifth need and uh, information seeking behavior models, they projected this more concentrated physical and chemical biological process use information to have a change in physical state. There are five sense of information. There are five laws of library science. The information also thought and memory. Information is the state of human mind. Second one is communication process. Information is a stimulus 
pursued by human. Information is an artifact. Information is a matter that has been manipulated by various information source, service, sectors, peoples, and energy. Information is a kind of energy. Identity in cyberspace, where information is on instantaneous state of cyberspace. Therefore, in the context, so now we are in the trend shaping education, OECD 2020, dilating the dynamics of globalization. Where our crowded planet population, more information on environmental changes. Where now, today and yesterday, the Glasgow Environment Meeting is going on. No, in the internet uh, scenario, international scenario like this, evolving social changes, changing age structures, changing patterns of social expenditure, inequality on the rise, etc. Changing the cycle patterns. More flexibility in the market, knowledge exchange, transformation of childhood, living in more diverse families, ICT in the next generation, where important changes are taking place in the universal access, extensive use of computers, the evolving world wide web, rapidly growing participation in the online, major global influence on the trends, United Nations transforming our world. The 2030 agenda for sustainable development, sustainable information, sustainable development of the digital information, evolving digital information environment, public libraries are community centered, are recognized as community asset. Now, IFLA core influences the vision of IFLA is the trusted global voice of the library and information community. We empower. And inspire society by providing access to information, knowledge, and culture for all to support development, learning, creativity, and innovation. IPLA trend report says that UN WSIS SDG Sustainable Development Group Advocacy 2030 agenda is access to information, universal literacy. Significance of culture and cultural heritage. Using this mechanism, programs and activities move from global to a local. Therefore, libraries and libraries, schools, and today we can smart city nation. Today we are talking about smart library, smart cities, smart cities over the country, over entire. Our present government announced the many, but. So far, unfortunately, there is no smart libraries yet to announce that. We're talking on the big data. We're talking on open access culture. We're talking on Internet of Things, Web 4.0, artificially intelligent, ubiquitous computing, and all these things have blocked the chain in this. And library schools and library teachers, the crossroads, especially in the context of new education policy. Therefore, the new mission is. Linking the linking data, linking the people and apps, and therefore the knowledge to the ideas into the business, the informing and ideas to be synthesized and sharing the information. So this diagram is going to the review and more on the library's new mission and new information knowledge information. Here the information blended library. Information is example. Clinical information is combined two years of expertise such as science, medicine with library or information science. The blended library combines multiple skill sets. Use them in the multiple roles. Example: teacher, researcher, librarian, and IT specialist. And conceptual focus: information document or provision how to make that. To provide the information. And the information document to the user where Ranganathan is located. Information right document right user at the right time. Information linking or knowledge synthesize. Information use involves information integration, learning, writing, and problem solving involves knowledge synthesis. Integration pieces of information into a coherent. Knowledge of structure. Therefore, now the role of a librarian 
Now today, the technology revolution has taken place. Then the globalization, the globalization, explosion of the internet. This explosion of the internet, user needs and expectation is expecting more. User needs also is depend on the internet and web resources. And the role of a librarian has changed. Many important things are changing in the digital environment. As a trend report says that these trend reports used were selection of high profile and well regarded reports which were hitting the headlines at the time of writing. The NEMS origin reports are all established annual publication identifying and describing emerging technologies likely impact on higher education over the next five years. The trend one changing the user behavior. Three sub trends are included in this setting consumerism, ICT, and such approaches. Group C and D left more consumerist approach from student as a major concern, according the high priority given to the student experience described here. The trend to a legal statutory issue. The web and social networking have changed the perception of information ownership, identify HIPLA, and which also predicts that the boundaries of privacy and data protection will be redefined. The trend three is changes to physical space. As electronic access increase, the possibility of releasing space formerly used to outspread materials opens up law expert of a library information sign. He says that space is more important than storage space. While the ITCA survey long and stonewall field in 2013 sees that provision of undergraduate space as a poor service of widespread importance to those who responded. Then trend four, collaboration, the continuing trend. As well as the six trends identified the above, there is one meta trend, the collaboration and new convergence. Libraries have always worked collaboratively. This topic is one of the top five list topic in our since 1986 and where our article was published in library management, the new world firm, the firm is dying. So therefore, the new evolving software, library management, information source or any other ILMS software, you have to update. Therefore, these the published topics are highlighted in the Academic College Research Laboratories. This has been one of the, our great strength. Then the areas for skill development, changing higher education environment, as in the context of new education policy, where our Karnataka state is a first implemented state in India, the new education policy has influenced a lot on the library and information service also and impact assessment, return on investment, use change management, community building, value studies, multi-professional working, influencing and negotiation, globalization, and now MOOCs have created a lot of platform on digital environment, creativity and innovation. Therefore, this information technology and the socio-technical perspective Wearable technology. Technology is not an ultimate, it's a tool. You since your human interference is required. So therefore, wearable technology is required. Then today we're talking about the digital environment, web environment, now semantic search, semantic web, ontologies oriented. Therefore, the semantic web is very important in the socio-technological perspective. Then linked data. So data is very important. So therefore, now today we are linking the data. Where I am giving in my slides, I was explaining the linking. Where else? Therefore, origin of the scanning the document, tracking user activity and data analytics. Today we are talking about the Google Analytics and Altmetrics. All these things have the data analytics and very important on the tracking user information. Also, the changing nature of scholarly communication, digital research, 
today all these things we are today for the last 18 months or nearly 20 months we are all on digital on webinar digital information on sitting at home all these things are online information now today text or data mining then dissemination of research interdisciplinary research research data management research data management is also an important things in the changing nature of scholarly communication. The digital humanities. So digital humanities, then halt metrics, bibliometrics is one very important tools in the changing nature of scholarly communication. Now today in the changing user behavior. So in the context of digital information or digital information, changing the user behavior also. So one is on digital literacy. Second is digital marketing. Now today, everything, even for tender coconut, if you drink today morning, you pay 20 rupees or 30 rupees on through your mobile. So digital marketing, digital communication, including social media, all these things, your Twitter, social media, everything in the changing user behavior. Then customer service. The customer service, student experience, and engagement of student, eliciting feedback and consultation, then the networking. The networking is big issues in this changing user behavior. There, oh, the changes to physical space, ethnographic research methods, user involvement. This user involvement is also an important in the changing context. Therefore, the collaboration. So the collaboration is all very important where the collaborative, the author paper publication, networking, say for example, in the field of library science, uh, maybe collaboration is less. In the science, physics, chemistry, mathematics, there are so many authors the collaborating. Recently, one of the chemistry paper, I came to know that there are 240 authors collaborated for one single paper. Uh, you can imagine how this collaboration work, networking, influencing and negotiation, community building. So therefore, the community building is also very important in the changing environment. Cross-sector working, so cross-reference, cross-sector, all these things have influenced in the library environment also. International working in the field, either library or physics or chemistry and any subject. So now the interoperability is also an important where the now today many libraries say, for example, we have a three libraries, Indian Shats, Kalinshut, uh, head of is Calcutta, then Delhi, Bangalore. If you use the same software, any library software, you can interoper and all these things, you can share the information where the seven important libraries cataloging, Library of Congress, Harvard University, Cambridge University, and many libraries are sharing the information, sharing their catalog information. So where information is important tool for the information. Say for example, Indian Shats College of Bangalore, I am sitting in Kengeri, I can access information on Our institute is in Kengeri, it is 10 kilometers from railway station Bangalore, it is named called Kengeri. Now I can access the information. Hungary also because of the student networking, community building, interoperability, international working, and web linking. All these things have influenced a lot in the field of information. Therefore, the five core studies of area, information in human cognitive communication system. So information is a human cognitive. So therefore, digital information, knowledge information, and the information where you can access at 24 into 7. The idea of desired information is also an important tool. Therefore, the effectiveness of information and information transfer. The effectiveness of information, where the role of information, the role of digital library, the role of web information where you can transfer the information to the user community. The relationship between information and generator. This is very, very important. How this information generating to the user community. 
so user community so where the relationship between information and user that's what the td wilson in the information seeking behavior in 1981 self has made that information seeking behavior models where the information is flowing in the cognitive or rls ellis models ask anomalies of status of knowledge is also an important in this context where the information and user are bringing to the in one platform where the information and generator aggregator or publishers or the information to its information role in the effectiveness of information changing the environment there are so many courses in the digital environment so there are digital libraries website design computer information internet network digitization digital preservation design information architecture cyberspace and law and policy knowledge management today the knowledge management knowledge organization many libraries are changed the nama culture the library we become a knowledge center today we have a karnataka in mangaluru there is one pathan mulla medical college the library name is knowledge center so library need to change but knowledge provider so therefore the competitive business strategic information interface and user interface these are the courses all conducting then metadata computer network security internet reference application information seeking behavior all these things have been taken care the many university schools library schools information schools are conducting this new course in the specialization in the past public librarians are talking about the public librarians academic librarians school media specialist law librarians archives and records management etc in the digital age today we are talking web design and technology digital preservation digital image digital management all these things have a digital specialization course therefore organizational changes in lis so organizational changes in lis education since 1980 typically take in the form of repositioning example school name when i was a student in bangalore university in 1988 department of library science department of library science now today a library and information science many schools they have changed the school name relocation example merger with another academic unit also maybe some reason maybe in the point employment there is no faculty some schools they have merged in the journalism and communication and libraries in one unit and closer of many schools in us also in the one third of the lis program in us has closed down many schools now they have started the high school also i means information schools the removal of l world becoming the adding of the i the removed the l they have added the i i means information schools the establishment of i information schools academic department taking a broad view of information science as the interaction of information people and technology mainly from lis library information computer science and management enabling so computer science when you talk about metadata the computer scientists they claim metadata is their field metadata they claim computer science field so librarian is to only implement only canvassing or you are the implementer that's what they say so therefore in the computer science also we have a some field and the management is labeling problem borden and robinson in many their articles some recent developments now the i schools construction information schools the graduate school of library information university of illinois uiuc they have changed the name culture high information school school of information studies syracuse okay school of information studies london increase integration between discipline changed r and d publication pattern example laboratory information retrieval in conference paper less visibility in journal 
Okay, information retrieval, so less articles. Therefore, this some recent development increase R&D, media and archival, digital library, IT drive, information technology is driving the field, information driving in our field and information tools, information technology has taken a lot of changes in the field of library and information science. The rapid development of digital technologies brings important opportunity to improve quality, access quality in education and also shape the influence how LS professionals are educated. Students can learn anywhere at any time following flexible and individualized pathways. Now today we are all online teaching everything because of this COVID situation. So now the student can learn anywhere but there are some issues bandwidth problem, network problem, hardware problem, software problem, so many issues are there. Now today, for the last 10 years, they were talking about digital life, the information, life, web technology, and all these things. But now, our last one and a half year, now we are facing what is real digital library? What is real problem of hardware, software, networking issue? All these things have now the social media present challenges to universities. Now many US, UK, and uh, many Western countries, they are pushing their information services through social media. But still India, we have to move a lot of things and still we are not in that position to implement. Have university responded to this change and providing a higher sort of education for them. In a less education, technology can be either part of the course content or the material. So therefore, pedagogy is a very important new ways of learning, characteristic by personalization, engagement, use of digital media, use of collaboration, bottom-up practices, facilitated by the exponential growth of open education resource, where the learner or teacher is a creator, learning content or emerging. There are many open education resources available. Therefore, the e-learning landscape concept trend, e-learning, online learning, distance learning, mobile learning, computer assistant technology learning, multimedia learning, cooperative learning, blended learning, hybrid paper, electronic service entered around the user, flexible learning in common environment with library 2.0, 3.4, everything. So therefore, now look at this, one of the Bangalore, one of the uh, important library in engineering college. So they have a, a new a digital library where you can sit and where you can access information 24 into 7, 365 days with all this technology, a full fledged digital lighting system, digital information, touching screen, all things are available in this library. So therefore, the changing interdisciplinary approach LIS in irritatively multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary knowledge and experience from other disciplines are needed to provide quality of LIS education. Sociology and psychology would help us to become more knowledgeable about the kind of information and services our users desire to have. Computer science would enable to take full advantage of technology in educating LIS educational. So therefore, the technology and application both are taken the taken care in this now the collaboration of partnership so look at this the global cooperation and partnership regional co uh, cooperation the joint curriculum development italy uk all these things so therefore this collaboration is also an important tool in this so therefore the research field where the research also have to take and care the big important information question for our time. Is there any agreement with the LIS discipline? What constitutes a big question for our LIS? So therefore, we have to take about the important universities, research institute into the research field, then we have to take in the research information. Application oriented. And now today, our syllabus should be meet and the uh, industrial uh, oriented. So it should not be just a two years degree or the uh, just passing the degree in the entire kind of a uh, question uh, based or a mark based degrees. So our, we should reach to the industry and the society. So challenge for the librarian, see, we need to more focused 
research agenda, evidence-based librarianship, clear vision for librarian role in the knowledge management. So therefore, there are some basic challenges, opportunities. OCLC report is there. I'm not going to touch that. Perception of libraries, information resource, Ithaka, 2000 studies and education study and OCLC study indicate that college students are more emphasis on the tools for self-discovery like that. So therefore, there are some influence on issues on the digital environment. Also, in the conclusion, Alliance education has developed in the past decade through curriculum revision, educational revision, ICT implementation, and other action. So therefore, Alliance program has introduced new courses and specialization while revising existing one at the curricula. The digital age has brought new opportunity in library information. Therefore, it is persisted in LA education, the core curriculum, organizational change, development of ICT, to reach the society. Good morning, Balbutta. So, thank you. Let's put the fundamental transformation of the library on the agenda and create the roadmap. Please mute. Very good. Okay, uh, thank you very much, sir, for your enlightening presentation. Uh, sir, we have some just, questions. Just, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I thank you, sir, uh, for such an informative and information oriented futuristic paradigm that is crucial or strategic in your word for the welfare of the society that you are kindly shared with us. Um, sir, we have received some of the questions that you may like to answer. Tell me, sir. Yeah, Chandra, please go ahead. Sir, the first question is, how do you envision the evolution of libraries in the Knowledge Society 3.0? Okay, evolution of the Knowledge Society. We have to see the madam user-oriented first thing. What kind of user, in which organization? That's what my organization environment is very important. Therefore, your knowledge flowing. So knowledge is two kinds. One is explicit knowledge and tacit knowledge where your library information can be put for the, your user. You have to identify the your user's background. So their knowledge, their library knowledge share the information through your technologies. The present technologies influence many platform, cyberspace, their social uh, environment, web space, or social media. There are so many platforms are there. There you can share the knowledge to the your user community. Okay, sir. Sir, there is another question. Uh, do you think the data analysis and semantic web technologies yeah. you mentioned are yeah. socio-economically sustainable in countries like ours? Yeah, but it will take time, I tell you. It's not immediately. Okay, say for example, for the last 30 years, we are talking about digital library, no? 1980 or 90s, we started digital library. 2000, uh, in India, we have introduced the digital technology. Now, 2021, 20 years. It took 20 year, years to understand what is digital library, what is digital harmony, what is digital uh, health humanities, digital humanities. It took 20 years. So another 10 years, now we are in web point four zero. No? So it will take semantic web and other technologies to understand the user, to bring the idea to the user. And it will take some more time, okay? But now today, many research libraries, okay, research institute, IIT's libraries, IM libraries, like ISI libraries, they are using this kind of technology. Maybe academic library and uh, university library, it will take some more time to introduce this kind of a service. Okay, now the young, where our young uh, library professional, they are all teach, they, are, they learn in the library schools about this library technology, semantic web, all these things they are learning, slowly they are going to adapt also, and our technologies also change. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, for answering the question. Okay, uh, sir, if possible, be with us. Yeah. Okay, sir. Over to Rajashida. <laughs> uh, since uh, I can see that uh, in the participant days, Dr. Rishabh Srivastava is here with us. Uh, may I request Dr. Srivastava to uh, present his case? Because uh, Mr. Jay Bhatt 
has sent us an asynchronous video recording of his talk, so that can be played afterwards still. So it's uh, your call, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello, Rajesh. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are absolutely not able. Okay, yeah. Thank Are you, you with the idea or it's your call? Yeah, I'll there, share my screen. I'll begin with my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, sir, um, uh, sir Krishnamurti. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will quit. Okay, okay. I will be uh, participating. I will uh, share the my. Yeah, yeah. I'll quit. Just give me one second. I'll share my screen. So, welcome, sir. Uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Rishabh Srivastava, uh, who is our second speaker of this session. He is the Assistant Professor of Department of Library and Information Science of University of Rajasthan, Jaipur. He is regularly presented paper in various conferences and journals. Uh, sir? Yeah, thank you so much. Can you, Shima, is my screen visible? No, sir, it is not visible. Oh, now it is visible, sir. Okay, thank you so much. It's okay. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rajesh Rashi, and uh, especially Mr. Dr. Amitabh Basuji, the principal of the college, and thank you so much for a wonderful introduction also. Uh, so I've, I had given my topic as Web 2.0, scholarly communication and all practice, but after the program was available with me, so I decided that I'll take up a small session of uh, uh, scholarly communication and get back more on all practice. So uh, I'll begin with it. So we'll take taking up the uh, path of the evaluation of research. This part I will be taking up. Uh, research evaluation is basically based on four pillars. There's our impact, quality, utility, and volume. Earlier, volume used to be the most important aspect of research evaluation. We used to believe that an institution or an individual producing the most uh, bulk of research is uh, actually playing the most influential roles. Uh, but uh, later on, we found that only a volume does not mean quality, a volume does not guarantee implementation of that research, impact of that research on society or academia. So what happened? Uh, now we have four pillars, impact, quality, utility. See, applied research, it has a lot of utility in itself, like research in automobile industry. The research is conducted just for utility so that we can find some good tire, quality of tire that is useful <coughs> in having a better uh, automobile developed. Then came quality. Uh, quality of research means uh, uh, it is measured by certain indicators uh, indicating what quality of research has been conducted, like the H index is for author level, the journal impact factor. These are actually sometimes based on uh, citations and other metrics. The most important one is the impact. I have gone with, uh, uh, I have to, uh, in the reverse method. So impact, it is very difficult to measure the research impact because basic research, the impact of basic research take times to be measured, whereas the impact of applied research uh, it's visible very soon. So the best uh, method we have been practicing uh, till now for measuring the impact of research has been citations. But citations measure only direct impact of research. They're unable to measure the indirect impact of research, like the societal impact of research or educational impact of research. Uh, so we'll, I'll come to that also. So popular methods for this research evaluation have been peer review process in which my peers will evaluate me for my research or using publication counts and citation based metrics. So in these two methods, what we have found is the second method is more economical because it is more objective, it is easy to calculate, it is easily available from databases. Whereas, whereas the above method, the peer review method take times, it's subjective, it's not objective. Sometimes there's a, a by the personal biases, systematic biases of institutions. So the most important one has been the citation-based metrics, indicators used in research evaluation that are derived or uh, based on citations. So uh, the first one to point out that uh, citations give prestige to a person or a researcher was Merton in 1973. Then uh, with the development of citation databases like the uh, Web of Science, it has been the most traditional one, most uh, prominent one. Then we came with uh, Scopus and Google Scholar came up in 2004. Then there were many citation databases were available with us from where we could get the citation data. So we could uh, get how much, how much a research work has been cited, how much an author has been cited, how much an institution, all authors of the institution have been collectively cited. So we have a metric which uh, we had uh, uh, that was based on citations like the H index, 
the journal impact factor. Based, obviously, these all are different level metrics, like the H index is for authors, not for journals, whereas the journal impact factor is for more journals. Then side score and others were subsequently developed by Scopus. SNP was also developed. So other metrics came up, which were based or based basically on citations. Many authors have pointed out the citation metrics suffer from many flaws. First of all, the citation latency, because citations take a lot of time to accumulate. For example, in mathematics, it takes sometimes more than two years for a single paper to be cited, because uh, otherwise in some biomedical areas of research, the citations are, can accumulate very quickly. So the evaluation of research on the basis of only citations ignores the educational and professional usage of an article. Suppose I am teaching in a class and I'm using somebody's research or a doctor, surgeon is operating uh, somebody, a patient, or based, based on a research paper that he has re recently read, but he's only using that research for educational or professional usage. He's not citing them actually in any of his own research products. So this is one of the basic uh, by a, the drawback of using only citation-based metrics, it completely ignores the other values other than the academy and research values of citation. Crown is, where friends or colleagues keep on citing each other. You give me citations, I'll give you citations, so the, we both can have a good side number of citations. Uh, scholarly outputs like data sets are seldom uh, indexed by citation databases. See, all these citations, the, the, uh, the number of citations are accumulated, we get from citation databases. Different citation databases have different indexing uh, limitations. Some index conference papers, some do not index conference papers. But others uh, than these proper search outputs, like articles, research papers, review papers, uh, other things like figures, databases, these data sets are not indexed in citation or databases. These are also good quality search products sometimes, like uh, clinical trials. Uh, research books cited by first rank scientists should be appraised above or better than those cited by scientists who haven't made significant contribution. This concept of weighted citation. Where suppose a research work is cited by only uh, citation of, of by authors or researchers of the equal level. And at the same time, a research work is cited by a Fields Medalist or a Nobel Prize winner. So they have been the, an argument of weighted citation. Also, citation should be given weights according to this area of research. Like in biomedical site, uh, area, the, site, the citations accumulate, accumulate very quickly. Where social science research or like humanities research, which is often geographically biased, it is limited to a geographical location, they get fewer citations. So we should have a mechanism of having a weighted citation scheme. Articles that are in open access get more citations and generally people who can tend to publish more in open access journals and the, get, uh, tend to get more citations because those journals are uh, those articles and research products are easily available everywhere. Otherwise, the journals, uh, research products that are published in paid journals or journals that are uh, available only by subscription, those papers get fewer citations because they are not readily available. General impact factor is now used by promotion or tenure committees, which is also based on uh, citations. Not all the articles published in journal may represent equal significance. See, journal impact factor is a journal level metrics. Suppose there may be articles in a journal which are getting 100 citations, thereby increasing the journal impact factor of the journal, whereas there would be articles in the same journal which will not be even getting a single citation throughout their life. So journal impact factor is a uh, journal level metric. It says nothing about the quality of each and every article. Not all articles, uh, not all scientists and professionals publish article in peer reviewed journals. Some which are indexed in citation databases. Some authors, especially in arts and humanities and social sciences, they tend to publish in journals which are popular in their institutions or popular amongst their peers. They do not publish in all only those journals which are indexed in web of science. And also, there are very few social sciences, arts and humanities journals which are indexed in web of science or scopus for that matter. So major issues with using only citation database metrics are they tend to publish more than publish good quality. Researchers now if they have to uh, produce a good research work throughout a period of one year or two years, they will break it into two or three more papers so that they get two or three papers indexed in Web of Science or a journal, uh, a journal having a good journal impact factor so that they can praise about themselves or for any matter that they have now three papers in such and such journal instead of producing only a sing single research out of that journal, uh, out research work. Easy is favored over difficult, see, because now citation come, uh, tenure committees, selection committees, they're uh, moving towards metrics, 
now researchers are taking up topics which are easier to publish rather than taking up the difficult to topics because now they know they want numbers they want more citations <coughs> interdisciplinary long term projects give way to short term projects because researchers are more focused on publishing good good numbers of research papers in journals with impact factor or to improve their own h index they prefer short term projects so that they can publish more now the biggest uh, drawback is <coughs> measuring only what can be measured instead of needs what needs to be measured this is what happened because all of our, our research was focused on uh, popular areas so citations can only measure the impact of research in academia it cannot measure the impact of a research in professional lives right so societal impact of a research because how a research changes the life of the people there may be a research product prepared by the best scientists of this country but the scientists would give their research as a report to the government the public health department why vaccination would be cheaper uh, to provide everybody free of cost rather than to uh, make it available on on some cost basis because public health department will suffer less because if everybody is vaccinated so such a research report will be given to a minister or the state department instead of publishing in a journal uh, in a journal or with the impact factor now this report will not get cited but this research report has played a major report, major purpose in academia in pub public life of people sorry not in academia but in day to day life of people so now we have we know uh, we all know about web 2.0 tools where uh, people have the power to use uh, to put uh, give their own input on uh, websites on basic uh, web platforms like uh, social media platforms uh, blog post they can create their own blogs uh, so the web 1.0 was static web now web 2.0 we have interaction with the society with, with the, we have the people creating the web like wikipedia to wiki pages etc so with the emergence of web 2.0 tools there also came a new metrics it's not only limited to social media metrics i'm telling it at the, at the beginning itself it's not limited as social media metrics but it gave to alternative metrics so these alternative metrics tend to be di different from the citation based metrics because they are going to measure the social impact of research the popularity of a research work so the limitation of citation based metrics acted as a catalyst in development of alt metrics definition of alt metrics has been in constant flux because uh, even niso did not come up with a very concrete definition of alt metrics because it's still changing but for example before the coining of the term alt metrics alternative metrics like alt metrics that is dependent on uh, social media platform on web 2.0 tools we used to say it wikimedia citations if my articles is uh, cited in a wikipedia page i used to say i have got a wikipedia citation but since the rise of the term alt metrics we say we have got a wikipedia mention so if the definition is still not clear i'll come to it uh, very soon a very widely accepted definition is the study of scholarly impact measures based on activity in online tools and in online tools uh, the and platforms this was given by grok so it says that this, the the alt metrics deals with measuring the impact of scholarly outputs on activity on online tools and social media platforms as tracks are like how much a research paper is being tweeted how many times a research work has been shared on facebook how many times a research work a research paper or conference paper has been has been bookmarked on mendeley how many times a research paper has been mentioned in a news platform how many times a research paper has been mentioned in a, some other research tool research uh, or another social media platform how many times someone has blogged about a research work so this instead of measuring how many times a paper or research work has been cited we measure how many times a research work has been mentioned or has been tweeted or whatever social media platform or online activity or like a wikipedia mention whatever it has been there so alt metrics various social networking sites like twitter research gate zotero siteo like etc reference managers like mentry are used by researchers tagging tagging papers on mendeley bookmarking them on mendeley sharing research connecting with each other collaborating on work together has become the new normal we come to know about papers through research gate and twitter earlier we used to come about uh, come to know about research work through indexing services through abstracting services through citation services citation databases but now we come to know about uh, we read some we find and uh, we open research gate and we find someone recommending some research so academic social networks have have drastically changed how a research work is uh, uh, 
made available to a researcher. Indexing abstractive services are uh, giving uh, way to a social media, uh, social networks, so academic social networks. However, altmetrics uh, should not be limited to only social media metrics. It's a subfield of infometrics and metrics. Altmetrics is used in an umbrella term, focusing on measuring of impact of research publications in social media. Like if a research work is tweeted, even tweets is a altmetrics. Shares, number of shares is an altmetrics. Number of mentions in Wikipedia is an altmetrics. Number of uh, Reddit post is an altmetrics. Number of mentions on a YouTube channel or a social streaming media is altmetrics. So altmetrics is an umbrella term which is used for measuring impact of research in social media platforms, in news platforms, any other non-traditional platform. Any other non-traditional means, any other <coughs> platform which is not indexed by a citation database or a citation or aggregator uh, database or an indexing service. Altmetrics can be used at present stage as complementary metrics to give the insight of impact of research, which cannot be measured by a citation database. See, citation database measures citations, so they can measure the direct impact of research. But educational impact, professional impact, popularity of the article, these all measures can only be measured by measuring or impact of a research of scholarly output on social media platforms or platforms that are Web 2.0 based. There are major sources of alt metrics. <coughs> there are major alt metric aggregators uh, like Mendeley, Twitter, altmetric.com, Impact Story, Plumex Metrics, Crossref, etc. So I'll uh, briefly discuss with you all of them. Mendeley is a citation manager tool that supports resource discovery. If you have a uh, Gmail account or any other email account, you can create an uh, uh, account in uh, Mendeley too. Uh, Mendeley is now acquired by Elsevier. There you have the uh, option of bookmarking papers, papers, storing papers. It's also available as a desktop application. So if you bookmark papers, people will come to know what you have bookmarked. By, by measuring the total number of bookmarks a research paper gathers, we can come to know how popular, how much readership that paper has. So Mendeley has been a very big source of measuring alternative metrics because earlier measuring readership or me measuring popularity was very difficult. We do have usage metrics, but usage metrics simply tells us about the downloads. We do not have concrete evidence if someone has bookmarked. Here also somebody can bookmark without reading an article, but still we have a very good preference that if a person has bookmarked an article on Mendeley, so maybe the article is of interest. Yeah, but surely Mendeley bookmarks can be manipulated. Some, if I am a prominent teacher, I will ask me, I'm asked my students or my colleagues to bookmark my paper. So this happens with most of the, most of the alternative metrics because they are still manipulated. Twitter has been a very important platform. It has been a very vocal about democracy, about being very open. So in, it, in Twitter, we have micro blogs, which are referred as tweets. Suppose a person tweets a research paper, he finds it interesting. Suppose a research work uh, uh, focusing on uh, addiction research, which is very much relevant in this, for the society. Somebody tweets it. So we can measure the number of times a research work has been tweeted. So we can come to know about how much social attention it is gathering, how much important it is among the users who are using Twitter. Twitter can be used by the general public as well as, as, well as by researchers. So we will find in research it has been found there's uh, physics research or concrete research in areas of physics, mathematics. It is often tweeted by people involved in academia itself. Whereas research in biomedical sciences or sociology or social sciences, social work is more tweeted by the general public. Because if I found, some, found something interesting on Twitter, which deals with uh, journalism, I may just tweet it about it. So now we can measure the alternative impact of an article because how what uh, distinct feature it has found. So different types of organizations now, journals themselves, are making uh, Twitter handles so to, to promote their research work. So we can see that Twitter mention can be complementary to citation main, citations. Citations can measure the impact of research on academia, whereas Twitter can mention the popularity of research, the impact of research on the general public, how much it has an impact, social impact on people. Now, a big aggregator has come up by the name of altmetric.com, <coughs> by far the most popular source of altmetrics. It categorizes its altmetric, uh, altmetrics into three broad dimensions, record of attention, measure of dissemination, 
and an indicator of influence and impact. Uh, it collects uh, data from policy documents, over 2,000 mainstream media outlets, most publication peer reviews, Mendeley and Wikipedia mentions, open syllabus projects, which are uh, 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 being now given a lots of impo uh, importance, uh, patent mentions, mentions in paper, patent documents of various countries, blog mentions, suppose somebody creates a blog and uh, researchblogging.org has been a very out there. I think now it has shut down, but uh, in that we could, found, uh, we could find so many research blogs that deal, uh, dealt with uh, research blogging, Facebook mentions, Twitter mentions, etc. It has come up with its own indicator known as the arithmetic attention score. It is not simply calculating the alt metrics from each and every platform, like uh, uh, totaling the getting a to some total of tweets, uh, Reddit mentions, and etc. No, it's a weighted count of overall attention received by a research work. So it gives different work, different weightage to different mentions. It gives more weightage to news mentions. It gives than it gives to Twitter mentions because it thinks that article it's easier for articles to get tweeted rather than to be men, uh, them to be mentioned by news media or news platforms. So uh, recently, mandatory readership counts, citations from dimension inside you like bookmarks do not account for our altmetric attention. So, so altmetric attention score is a uh, weighted metrics. Okay? It's the aggregate metrics developed by altmetric.com itself. It's their product, but it has recently gained very much attention because not most of the journals are having altmetric attention score displayed on their website for particular articles. So it's an aggregate metric. It will take uh, tweets, number of tweets. It will take number of mentions in your Reddit, it number of mentions in news, number of mentions in your streaming media, and then give different weights to different mentions and then come up with a single score that is the altmetric attention score. Researchers working in the area of fault metrics can calculate, uh, can uh, sorry, uh, communicate with altmetric.com and then they can communicate with them and they can have access to altmetric uh, data for their own uh, purpose. Then came up impact story, Heathover Pivover and, uh, and Heather Pivover and uh, Jason Priam are its co-founders. Interestingly, Jason Priam has been the the person who, who has been responsible for coining the term altmetrics. It has received Alfred P. P. Sloan Foundation grant of dollar one twenty five thousand. So you can see the, it is getting too much in, uh, funds from various funding agencies because now even funding agencies want to have an alternative metric. They want to see how alt metrics develop so that instead of only relying on citations to give their fundings, they want something new. Like national, uh, like the National Science Foundation has granted dollar three hundred thousand. So they want to see how all the metrics develop, or if they can replace the citation databases. So it can replace the citation-based metrics, but it's still under research and it's under uh, it's still a uh, very recent topic. So uh, the impact story has gained a lot of import importance. It's completely different from altmetric at uh, dot com. They are a separate aggregator. Impact story is a separate aggregator. And Plumex Metrics, founded by Michelle, has now been acquired by Elsevier. It has classified its own alt metrics into the citations, usage, captures, mentions, and social media. Like altmetric.com did it in three, uh, it divided its metrics in three parts. Plumex Metrics has classified into five parts so citations, usage, captures, mentions, and social media. So you can see the uh, Description over here, citation, this citation such as scopus as well as citations that help to measure societal impact. Usage, uh, it helps to, it measures clicks, downloads, views, library holdings, etc. For captures, it relies on bookmarks, quote folks, favorites, readers. For mentions, blog posts, comments, reviews, so mentions in blogs, these are all aggregated by it as mentions. Now you can see, so many publishers of prominence have now merged <coughs> or are showing Plumex metrics on their platform, like Epsco Host, uh, Scopus, uh, Science Direct, SSRN. So all of them are showing Plumex metrics, Plumex scores on their, on their websites. In the end, I'll conclude all metrics are a new and emerging area of research evaluation metrics. Research at this point suggests that all metrics may act as complementary to citation data based metrics. They may be able to measure a wider impact of research, which the traditional metrics may not be able to. But however, we should keep in mind the disciplinary difference, which may also affect the users of, uh, of alt metrics. There are certain areas of research which are more profitable. It may be possible that alt metrics does not measure the direct impact, or it measures only popularity of research. 
there are studies which find correlation between citations and metric alt metrics but there are also studies which find dis very distinct finding there are research may be tweeted a lot of time but uh, which will gain a very few which will gain very few citations however alt metrics have also been early indicators of impact they have found that uh, many uh, research works papers getting alt metrics earlier tend to be cited too much later on but still we have need to conduct more disciplinary studies more on different disciplines to have a concrete finding thank you so much if there are any questions we can go through them yeah uh, thank you so much dr sivastava for choosing to deliver it on uh, such an interesting or should i say alternative area of citation analysis uh, well uh, i was just co-thinking while you were talking you talked about the weighted way that uh, automatics uh, like to deal with Oh, I was thinking in a different sector, of course. Uh, is uh, can there be? It's a my question, of course. Can there be any weighted uh, standard for uh, annotating uh, data coming out of the cultural heritage? I mean, uh, it is my. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I problematize the the, the fact that uh, all the standards coming out of from um, global north and it is called such a, such a way that Anglo American Catalan code or Dublin uh, code made it initiated. So uh, I think it at times lack annotating data coming out of the culture heritage. That, that, uh, whatever, it's a different topic and different story altogether. We would like to take some questions, of course. Uh, I think Dr. Shuharti Shorkar. Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics of our college, would like would have something in his mind. I would like uh, to. Uh, I, I would request Shuharti to please unmute himself and directly pose a question. Yeah, to, I, yeah. you are audible. Yes. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So it was very informative and it was a really fantastic and detailed analysis of how the real world, the real world scenario of the cytome of the citation and how the research. Uh, domain is now uh, manipulated by the way the papers have been cited. Say, for example, recently we have heard that the Stanford University has published the data for the top 2% scientists in all over the world. So in that, uh, that data is also based on the on the H index, which is also citation based and also the number of citations. So, so those things are very likely to be uh, manipulated just like we have uh, documented right now. So, but as, as you have said that old metrics is an alter, alternative domain which has to be nurtured and it, it, it has to be also in, incorporated. So then how can we just develop the kind of uh, popularity for old metrics so that it uh, actually it also gets e that equal importance as of citation and uh, and then it and then the uh, quality of a paper or the or the uh, contribution of a researcher can be judged based on that so how can you popularize that all metrics yeah th thank you so much sir for a very uh, uh, important question see popularity will take time the, the citation databases have been there since the 1950s or the 60s and now if you go through people who are not from the field of library science or not from so people who are not dealing with research evaluation. Uh, most of the people, especially in social, natural sciences and biomedical sciences, they simply rely on journal impact factor as the measure. H index is also recent. But uh, simple, if you we go to people, they will uh, simply go on and uh, they will keep on uh, telling that, uh, OK, I have published these many journal papers in these such and such journals. So because it has been there in our lives for such a long time, it will take some time for people to realize what alt metrics is. Because their funding agencies and their even UK research and excellence framework has now taken up the alt metrics as one of the indicators for research evaluation exercises. So their welcome trust has also taken up alt metrics as one of the uh, indicators for alt metrics uh, for research evaluation. So it will take time in the Western countries. People have started using alt metrics, but still, because even alt metrics are manipulatable. Uh, number of tweets can be manipulated, number of men Mendeley exactly. mentions can be manipulated. So it will take time, uh, but researches are research is being produced where we are we are finding that alternative metrics may be complementary to citation databases right now, but it will take some time because citations are actually if we do not manipulate them or if they are measured correctly, they are very concrete evidence of impact. Uh, but there may but at the same time we are finding research which shows mental leadership, Twitter mentions, Facebook mentions are also concrete measurements of an alternative impact 
of research, which cannot be measured by citations. So it will take some time, sir, for people to know more about more uh, seminars and workshops should be organized by people working in the area of earth metrics to let people come to know their perception of our indicators to let them know how much difference can uh, this create. Yes, sir, sir, at this moment, sir, say, say, suppose that you have been given a task to judge the quality of 10 researchers, then okay. how are you going to judge the quality of the 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 person based on the research output? So at this moment, how are we going to, as a judge, how will you judge them? Okay, that's a very nice question. But uh, in, uh, if I am given a task for me, myself, I will have to go through the journals they have published and which volume they have published it, if they are published in journals. First of all, okay. uh, we are not talking about conferences right now. If then published in journals, so which journals they have published? If that journal, how old is that journal should be? On what, which publisher publishes it? How old it has been? In which indexes it ha has it been indexed? If suppose it is a journal of, um, suppose uh, mathematics itself, and if then if it's indexed in math signet, so I will say that okay, this journal has at least fulfilled the criteria of math signet. So then after that, first of, all, first of all, going through where it has been published. So that gives me a very good uh, information about the rigorous peer review it has gone through. Then I would come to citations and alt metrics. Obviously, in, uh, if I'll go, go through the citations, but I will also verify if the citations claimed by that person. Because if, if my name in a research uh, in a citation database is Shrivastavar, anybody with uh, Shrivastavar uh, can get my citations, I can also get somebody's citation. So I will go through their profiles and see if the citations they are talking, claiming are actually their citations. Then I'll come to alt metrics. So verify of their research is also popular or having an alternative impact in society. This will be my So, so sir, at this moment, do we have any uh, anything from where we can see the alt metrics? Say, suppose that for citation, we have Scopus, we have JCR. So from yeah. there we can easily judge that okay this this many uh, this, this many papers are cited this many papers and this is the H index and this, this is my H index this is my Q1 Q2 journal but but for all metrics then how can we have I altmetric.com we have we can go through the we can go to Mendeley and find out how many times a the research work has been mentioned on Mendeley we have impact story Plumex metrics obviously right now they are on paid services. But we, these indie these platforms are are working as aggregators and they are collecting various alt metrics. Okay, 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 sir, sir. Thank you so much, sir, and thank for you. your kind and for your kind permission, I just like to mention that I am not a sir. I'm from a background for math from mathematics actually. I'm a math okay. math professor. Okay, so, thank you so much. It's very nice that I'm, you have such interest. But I'm keenly interested in all those things actually. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank very you interesting so much, sir, for thank your you. nice presentation. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, any other doubts? Yes, there is no. Uh, thank you, uh, real Dr. Srivastava, for such an uh, educative and enriching session. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, and, we, and yeah. thank you all your college team and your IIT Jodhpur team for thank inviting so me. Thank special thanks to Vikas, Vikas sir, obviously, and thank you so much. Yeah, yeah of course, thank you. of course. And uh, we'd like to, uh, I mean, uh, discuss further uh, too. So, uh, uh, may I ask uh, Chandana to please? Uh, move from here and thank you Rashida. Uh, our next speaker uh, mr jai bhad uh, sent his uh, video lecture and now we are uh, going to present his uh, lecture video uh, he is an engineering librarian of scholarly communication drexel university libraries of drexel Rashida, please share the uh, screen. Chandana, is it visible? Which phone? Yes, sir. It is visible. Thank you so much for inviting me to present at the International E Conference on Library and Allied Subjects in Network, ELAN 2021. My topic is Recent Developments in Open Educational Resources 
in science and technology. So what are open educational resources? I'm sure that most of you have heard about this, uh, but the interest in open educational resources, open access, open journals, open data is increasing day by day. A lot of researchers, or faculty members, or students are always interested in learning more about it. Uh, so these are free available resources, high quality teaching, learning and research materials that are free for people everywhere. They are usually interdisciplinary in nature, uh, uh, different types, books, lectures, courses, modules, open textbooks, open access articles, preprints, images, data sets, software simulations and education videos. So you can see that there are a variety of open resources are available. If you think in terms of textbooks, in STEM disciplines, uh, these books are very, very expensive. Cost of text textbooks are increasingly rapid, resulting in financially in over overburdened students. Libraries in the US usually do not purchase textbooks. This presentation highlights ways in which educational institutions develop and implement mechanisms and help students in using open educational resources. And the best part is that these open education resources can be integrated in course management systems. So they can be available through online courses that students have easy access. Um, and many universities like this also subscribe to electronic books. Uh, they are subscription based, but they are available for students uh, at no cost to them because it has been paid by the university subscriptions. And for science and engineering, and in particularly in engineering, um, uh, relatively the open access ebooks uh, are still not uh, able to satisfy the needs of major engineering disciplines. So the questions that we are trying to answer are a number of questions. And first of all, how do we motivate faculty members to use open educational resources in their courses to help students in saving costs? Um, many of these faculty members are used to using their own textbooks or other textbooks, which are quite expensive in nature. How do we make aware that to our faculty, our researchers, there are a number of online resources available that are, can be, they're good, they're quality, and they can be used. What are some ways in which science and engineering libraries educate faculty members about these resources, about doing workshops, teaching, seminars, going to their offices, and educating them about all these different tools? And of course, they need to first assess and evaluate themselves, the quality of these resources so that they can be able to integrate them into courses. How do we inspire them in contributing to, towards their own OER resources? Could be open textbooks, open access articles, and so on. And preprints is recently, recently relatively new phenomena for engineering. And uh, past COVID, during the COVID days, uh, number of preprints have started evolving, especially in, in the medicine and biology areas. And physics and all those are have been existing in the past. Um, and the question to explore is, can they assist new researchers and students in improving scholarly contributions in journals? Can they help them writing a good research paper? Uh, and usually uh, a preprint submission can result in a submission uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the authors can get a lot of feedback uh, from other experts, uh, and we will briefly talk about it later on. Um, from the, if you look at Drexel University libraries, we, we have this particular library guide on open education resources. Um, and our faculty and staff continue to look for ways to reduce the cost of education. Uh, uh, open educational resources, including open textbooks, provide one way to reduce overall cost for Texas students. Uh, uh, but remember, they 
OER can be a variety of resources. It could be videos, it could be simulations, could be other educational learning objects, and those can be uh, also available in a free uh, environment. So they need to know uh, that such tools exist. And this is a screenshot from our library uh, guide, uh, which talks about what are different ways that students can find open educational resources, in particular textbooks. So open textbook library, open stacks, with the text, my lot, OER commons are some of those. And we are going to explore this uh, in the next few slides. Open textbook network, open textbook library, you can see that you can be able to browse in different subjects. Uh, there's this description about open textbook. You can be able to search here. So you can see that variety of different subject areas available, including engineering, humanities, medicine, mathematics, and so on. Here's two examples for electrical engineering uh, books. DC electrical circuit analysis, AC electrical circuit analysis, and so on. And there are many other such textbooks available uh, for free. And this can be available from anywhere in the world. So students and faculty even in India, they can take advantage of this. If, if, if I take the example from a science perspective, and I'm looking at natural sciences textbooks, and one of them is genetics, agriculture, and biotechnology. Uh, this has been a textbook from Iowa State Universities. And you can be able to go and download this, read this book online. Then we go talk about the texts. Uh, it clearly uh, defines their mission and values. Uh, their mission is to unite students, faculty, scholars in a cooperative effort to develop an easy to use online platform for the construction, customization, and dissemination of open education resources to reduce the burden of unreasonable textbook cost to our students and society. So um, the textbooks cost is a big issue, um, quite expensive. So uh, there are many uh, collaborations happening all over the US and all over the world to make sure that in some ways, those books are available uh, free to the students. Um, an example of chemistry library here, uh, which is the Living Library is a principal hub of the Liberty Text Project, a multi-institutional collaborative venture to develop the next generation of open access text to improve post-secondary education at all at all levels of higher learning. Their, this, their approach is highly collaborative, where an open access textbook environment is under constant revision by students, faculty, and outside experts to supplant conventional paper-based books. So you can see that there's a tremendous creative collaboration among students, among faculty, and other experts. And there are also learning objects available. And these are some more examples here uh, uh, from the perspective from campus bookshelves. Uh, there are two classes of text found in bookshelves, textbooks and text maps. Textbooks are the central support for integral content into a library and identified by book. So, uh, so you can see uh, general chemistry, organic chemistry, eugenic chemistry. These are some sample examples, but you will have to go and explore by going to the website, the website yourself. Merlot system, another one um, that provide access to curated online learning and support materials and content creation tools led by an international community of educators and researchers. And you can be able to search the Merlot collection, other labs in the web. Um, so again, uh, you can just find the website for Merlot, just type Merlot in Google and should be able to find, and you will be able to uh, uh, use um, Merlot smart search option, which extends access to learning materials well beyond current curated and peer-reviewed collection. A smart search was developed to answer the pervasive and nagging question, where can, where can I find open educational resources? Um, so with smart search users can search more than a dozen learning materials libraries to find OERs very quickly. 
So uh, please explore this and uh, number of excellent collections available here. And these are some examples. And here I'm looking at physics example. So different type material types. For example, this material is a reference material. Uh, the second physics surface demonstration is kind of simulation. Uh, cogent physics is kind of collection. It's a full, fully peer-reviewed open access journal with a mission to help researchers communicate with the global partnerships and some of those um, important aspects. And this particular uh, uh, example is an open access textbook. And this one is an online course. So you can just see it from this example, there are four or five different types of open access um, material we are finding. A reference book, simulation, a journal, open access textbook, and even an online course. So it's just an example from physics within my work. And there's a browse section, there are different communities, there are what benefits are available. Please uh, explore this. This is one of wonderful collections. Mason OER MetaFinder is a discovery tool that searches for OER content. Uh, so you can just um, search uh, and you can uh, see uh, what, what are different things that it searches here. All categories, OER specific sites, deeper search, and so on. And here is another example. Uh, using MetaFinder, and I in this particular example, I'm searching for machine learning, and um, and then here are two examples. Again, this is a course, and the first item is a book uh, by Sta Stanford in courses, which covers a number of techniques in machine learning, and this uh, is a course that provides broad introduction to machine learning data mining and statistical pattern recognition. So again, this is all an open platform. So your students, your faculty, your researchers, and anyone needing to learn more about machine learning, which is a growing field, a uh, lot of demand, uh, you will be uh, finding this content very useful. Next thing I want to introduce you is the open education resources commons. Another um, uh, ISKME created four-year comments uh, pu publicly launched in February 2007 to support and build a knowledge base around the use and use of open educational resources, open educational resources. It is a network for teaching and learning materials. The site offers engagement with resources for curriculum alignment, quality evaluation, social bookmarking, tagging, rating, and reviewing. So now we will cover uh, more about OER Commons and what you can find, what different subjects are available. I'm taking an example of Applied Science. OER Commons is a public digital library of open educational resources, explore, create, and collaborate with educators around the world to improve uh, curriculum. So you can be able to search very easily and you might, you can be able to select any subject of your interest by just going in the search box and selecting and exploring. Here is an example. Um, I'm using within applied science, architecture and design as a subject area. But you can see that there is computer science, there's engineering, there's environmental science, health, medicine, nursing, information science within applied science. Uh, similar there is an area for business and communications and humanities, for example. So you could be able to explore uh, all those different subject areas. And this the interesting book, one, two, three, four, what is it will be Goldberg machine. Um, then you can be able to learn about the be Goldberg machines set in the imagination on fire. Uh, so it is a homework assignment type of material. Um, and uh, all the copyright uh, information is also provided. Uh, so continue to search and explore OER comments, another great resource. So um, 
because engineering, uh, Wetzel has so many different engineering departments, electrical, mechanical, civil, biomedical, uh, and there are so many other ebook platforms such as Progress ebook, Central, Access Science, Novel, KNOVL, that those are very specific uh, books uh, available to students and faculty, which is subscription based. As I mentioned before, um, uh, libraries, university pays for the subscription, but students and community has uh, no cost for that. So we would like uh, them to use this collection. Uh, at present, engineering open textbooks still need to evolve in public to not meet the needs of ed and all the engineering course materials. Uh, as I mentioned, we subscribe to many of these tools. Students do not spend on buying ebooks or ebook chapters. Faculty members can navigate through these collections of electronic books, select appropriate chapters of relevance, propose syllabus, and have them integrated in their management system. I'm giving an example of our construction management library guide, which is also civil architecture and ornamental engineering. And here are some examples, uh, of which is our discovery platform, grad and search that we call it. And I'm filtering by material type as book chapter. So if I'm interested in construction management, then just click on construction management, then students are able to find those uh, book chapters, whether it is soil mechanics, or highway engineering, or earthquakes, sustainable building, and so on. And any other keywords are using key, uh, advanced keywords, they can find any other books, any of those keywords, they are not part of this customized collection of search uh, queries. And this is how our Dragon Search finds books, and I'm searching for construction management, filtering to book chapters, and an example of an ebook construction management organization, eighth edition, and they simply click on it and they can download it. And this is what they're going to see when they click on the book. Uh, it tells me that this is full text available for novel, civil engineering construction until academic, and they can simply click on this to get access to this ebook. This is uh, Institutional Civil Engineers is the publisher of this book. And this is how a screenshot of a part for a chapter of that book that they can download. Open access article, uh, free digital image online availability of research articles uh, and has relatively few or no restrictions refers to open access publishing, particularly of scholarly communication in academia. Um, and open data, as I mentioned earlier, integral part of scholarly communication. Um, and we have created a whole library guide on open access that you can explore. And um, directory of open access journals, which is community created online directory that indexes and provides to high quality open access peer-reviewed journals, free of charge, um, uh, including being indexed in DOAJ, all data is fully available, and this is where you can search. Similarly, uh, director of open access repositories can be accessed from here. It can have different types of uh, data, such as images, data sets. Uh, this have metadata or document is sufficient to make it reusable. Um, an example of open access journals and articles, director of open access journals. When I had created this screenshot, there were 80 languages in 129 countries. Based um, many journals without author to, uh, article processing charges, APCs, um, and 17,000 approximately journals and article records. Um, I am um, the uh, uh, I'm filtering by those channels which do not require author article processing charges within science area. So I can be able to pull up those and I can then think about you know, those journals and see if it is possible for me to submit an article because I don't have to uh, pay uh, for the article to get published in the uh in that journal because uh, these are the journals that do not require article processing charges 
and nature communication is an open access channel to publish in nature communications uh, authors are required to pay an article processing charge and this is the cost uh, for for article processing charge so uh, a huge amount of money um, uh, and i hope that in times to come there are some changes and uh, as changes are uh, available in such a way that uh, our researchers and scholars can afford to submit those articles uh, for global benefits to the whole world. Uh, recently, uh, we also celebrated Open Access Week events at Drexel uh, just last week, October 25th to 31st. Uh, and the theme was It Matters How We Open Knowledge Building Structural Equity. Uh, and we have adopting open education is at Drexel and three weeks and open access. Uh, and the role in scholarly communication with the two events that we had and both the recordings, the recordings are also available. Uh, and I'm going to send you that link. What are preprints? We briefly mentioned earlier, these are an early version of an academic article that has been made available by the author for others to read online for free. Um, and uh, you might want to uh, click on this link uh, and access uh, that information. If you think of, about libraries, uh, usually most of the libraries would love reprints. Why? Because uh, look at the traits of our libraries. We have engaging, we have interactive, dynamic, visionary, we have, uh, believe in quick sharing of emerging information. Um, and preprint is an academic journal article in graph form prior to peer review, which allows quick access to research articles deposited before peer review, saves time in better to build our findings. Authors can get quick feedback inspired when to find their papers. Authors can start accumulating citations right away, enhances collaboration, builds on expertise in different disciplines, and research benefits. And uh, one of our PhD students also uh, gave an example of a preprint that he used uh, and earlier, and based upon that, uh, he also found that the same preprint uh, was refined and after six or eight months got published in a journal. Um, you know, but having the information for preprint really helped him do the work for his research. Um, preprint service are going fast. Will they continue to grow? These are questions we are all uh, trying to answer. Um, so many different disciplines are growing. Uh, uh, the equipments uh, were well established in disciplines such as physics, mathematics, and computer sci science through archive. Almost a dozen new preprint services have been launched. Society publishers initiated many such preprints, and you might want to explore this at this link. And ECS archive, Society for Automotive Engineering Mobility Archive, IEEE Tech Archive, Focus Archive for Ultrasound Research, they are all coming up, and there are many, many other. Uh, report of uh, the service are also available. Most publishers do not believe that these are publications, they are not peer reviewed, but rather deposits in different repositories. They are not publications, can they be published later in the journal article? And you can see that science, nature, tech archives, you know, as well allow the posting of reprints. Many publishers encourage the posting of reprints using Sherpa and Mio to find out what the policies are and publishers' website. We think that they will continue to grow as many new prints, uh, print repositories are evolving. Excellent way of for engineering graduate students, even new faculty members to share the research findings. Importantly, that the graduate students and the new researchers and new career scholars, researchers get feedback from other experts and they can improve upon their quality and they can submit in a um, improved version in a um, the scholarly journal later on for the publication there. More citations for preprint articles are expected. Uh, measures of citation data on preprints will be needed. Uh, and we think that publishers should come together to provide vision to create mechanism to enhance discovery of preprints. 
uh, one such repository is Prefix, where there are two uh, input number of the preprints, but many new preprints are not there. And here is the um, open access week event at our library on preprints, preprints open access and the role in scholarly communication. You can be able to watch the recording here, and here is the library uh, guide. And this session explored the advantages and disadvantages of preprints and how that influences scholarship of shaping the future of open access. And these are some websites that you might want to refer to for additional information. Conclusions, students need to assist them to save costs for their education. Libraries have a tremendous role to play in this mission. Uh, we need to encourage our faculty members to create and adapt to open education resources. We need to educate our faculty and students about various open educational resources. Uh, and in, uh, continue to integrate material from library subscribe ebooks in those uh, NG, uh, courses where uh, not enough content in OER is available. Become familiar with resources such as preprints and use them wisely. Improve quality of research papers and develop connections with scholars worldwide. This is, uh, we see a big advantage for new graduate students, and, uh, uh, advanced PhD students who are trying to publish their papers uh, and they can improve quality uh, in the process by feedback and develop connections in the process as well. And here is my contact information, uh, my email, and my websites. You can please email me for any consultations or questions you may have. Thank you so much for inviting me for the presentation. Thank you to Dr. Anoptas and Dr. Rajeshi Das for the invitation. Thank you so much and wish you all the best. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Shwati, are you saying something? Yeah, Shwati. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a small query, actually. So and shall I uh, carry on? No, man, I mean, you have to uh, clear your doubt from uh, Mr. Bhatt. Yes, 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 yes. No, Mr. B that, that that was a asynchronous video recording we played, actually. Okay, okay. So we, I, I can share the contact details that he also mentioned at the uh, end of his talk in the group so that you can uh, you, all, you all can uh, share your uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. yeah. And now uh, I, Binkat is here, I guess. Binkat, yep. yeah. Hi. Uh, hello, Binkat. This is Rajoshi. And welcome to ELAN 2020. Uh, we really unlike archivist from National Center of Biological Sciences, Bangalore, and or an, an archivist and another friend of open source resources and open access. Uh, now, and, and a formal uh, introduction is in order. Chandana, please go ahead and introduce Vinkat, and then we'll start our workshop for the day. Okay. Thank you, Rashida. It is my pleasure to introduce Srinivasan sir, who is an archivist at National Center of Biological Sciences in Bangalore. He talks about the art of spinning a yarn from documents, photographs, and other archival materials of historical importance. He is a research engineer by training, and he is also an independent science writer who has been published widely across Indian and international publication. Srinivasan, sir, uh, please uh, come forward and deliver your speech. Sir, please. Thank you. Thanks all. Uh, and thanks for this invitation as well. Um, Rajeshi, I uh, just want to see if we can just have a quick, uh, just to figure out how best we should go about this. As I mentioned, um, I want this to be more of an informal workshop and a discussion rather than a speech or a lecture because yeah, yeah. you've been here uh, just to you know probe some very fundamental questions about the archive uh, so uh, i guess my one question is uh, before i jump into it 
can can i just get a i don't know can we do a show of hands or is there any way to know if people have had a chance to look at the video um yeah. and it's fine i just want to get a how do we is there any way to do this to see if people have had a chance yes. to see here here and you can use the raise hand option so uh the the video is shared with you in the program schedule and the uh then prior to that uh those who have seen the video and have uh generated some questions can raise their hand and we can take the questions then so right uh, right um i mean i don't to jump directly into question but if you yeah. if you have seen the video um it will be great if you're able to just use the raise hand option or or if you have any questions of course you can put in the chat i don't want to put you in a spot but uh i just want to stress that um this is not a lecture i do want this to be an interactive conversation uh to understand your background our background and we'll both learn from each other in some small way so um one broad question that i generally like to start with because this session is titled probing the archive uh, and one broad question that i like to start with is uh what is your conception of the word archive if i had to keep it as and there are no right or wrong answers to this question um if if you're able to share your perspective on what you think an archive is and i don't mean to for it to sound as if it's a trivial question or a complicated question it's a question that is relevant whether someone is you know 20 years old or whether someone is 70 years old uh, and the answer to it will also vary from profession to experience and such so um uh, can can i just hear from someone i mean wh what is your perspective what what do you think an archive is no that's it shubhadeep would you like to volunteer please or anyone okay so uh, i think i see a comment in the chat saying uh, and i I'm, i apologize if i'm mispronouncing your name i think it's shirley who says it's a collection of cultural heritage resources that makes sense that's fine any any other ways to think about the archive so i've i've already seen the reason i do this is to try and make us think about some very basic things that we take for granted and some words that we use without uh and then complicate those words so i've picked on a few words the word culture is used the word heritage the word resource so i'm going to pick on these words any any other ways in which we have thought about an archive uh what is an archive what is not an archive again there are no right or wrong answers just whatever comes to your mind i received another input from our whatsapp group it's called it's it's saying it's memory oh that's great fantastic actually this is a really good uh trigger <laughs> in a way to uh, just check uh, okay fine i'll i'll put that word down as well okay so i got a uh, collection i got memory any any other ways in which we can think of the word um archive um to take uh, a collection of historical records okay i've seen the word history now make an entry i see the word any media this is an interesting point okay, we'll uh, touch upon that word a little bit more to take things from the forefront and store it in a place to be retrieved later so there is an idea of retrieval okay we're going to come back to this idea as well now um any anything else anything else that comes to mind is the archive you know if i had to put a time boundary to this question is the archive about the past the present the future or a combination of two of them or three of them what is the archive in your mind again no right or wrongs also it will be really nice if people are able to use their mic and speak otherwise i feel like it's i'm just speaking to myself so please you know let's 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 make it as if we are actually sitting face to face guys i know the pandemic has really made it bad for all of us uh, sir actually uh, my idea is that archive that, that has to be organized whatever we are storing in a way be it, it, it a memory be it a cultural heritage be it a historic record some organized way it has to be saved otherwise how can how, how are we going to access it in a later amount of time and with with regard to the point whether it is an uh, whether it is a past or future or present 
sir the time is always run, running for all now so whatever you try right, right now we are speaking face to face so this if it is now on record so it is also become an archive one second pass so for me it is like that whatever we are just keeping it is an in a record in an organized way which can be accessed at a future point of time that is an archive okay all right this is really good to capture so i've, I've taken the word organization so i'm going to put it broadly the idea of structure is something that you have brought in uh, I asked about this idea of past, present, and future. I noticed Shirley's uh, com comment in the chat to say it's a combination of the three. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so the the reason I'm I'm taking these questions and sort of putting these words together is is for us to complicate the word archive and to just put some things in context. Now, over the last twenty five, I would say maybe thirty five years, um, we have started to use the word archive increasingly in our day-to-day -day conversation. Um, you archive your email, people are archiving their Instagram records, you know, you probably are thinking about archiving Google Meet recordings like this. Um, there's a WhatsApp chat I heard, so you know, maybe you're thinking, you know, WhatsApp has a function about thinking about its archive. So the word has been doing its rounds. You know, if you if there was, you know, a trend graph to draw for the word archive, you'll start to see that it started to just surface quite a bit. Chandra, that's a great point, repository of stories. I'm going to come back to this point that you had raised. So at the same time, the way we use the word archive today, if we just think carefully, is in, in the form of an action, which is to say we are using it as a verb. The, the way you say I am going to, I am working on something, we start to say I am archiving something. I'm, I'm, I'm archiving my emails, I'm archiving my photos, I'm archiving my WhatsApp, I'm archiving my Google Cloud storage, whatever it is. But the origin of the word fundamentally is in the form of a noun, by which I mean it is in the form of a center. It is a, it is a space, a place. Right? So now, if you carefully look at the word archive, and you know maybe there are people in different, you know, who speak many different languages in this group, and I think this is a fantastic group, to ask this question, actually, perhaps one of the best. What do you think the word for archive is in your native language, whatever the language might be? Any ideas? I don't know. I'm asking. It's a genuine question from my end. What is the word for archive? May I volunteer? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. The, the Bengali synonymous is pretty, uh... Peculiar. It's called Likhagad. Exactly. So, and what do you think that word translates to in uh, English? If you have to translate it back into English in a literal way, uh, what does it translate to? It uh, might be close to the agar means repository, repository of something written, written right. manuscript, etc. Exactly. So, if you start to do this systematically in different languages, right? In, in various languages that are spoken across South Asia, you will notice that the word archive, in the way we have conceptualized or imagined it in each of our regions, is slightly different. What has happened is that we have taken the word from English, we have reimagined it in our own language, and we have seen it the way we have received it. And then when you translate it back, you see something slightly different. Any other languages? I mean, this was an example. So now there is a language in which it is a repository for written stuff. Any other language? No? Is that the only language spoken in this group? Yeah, exactly. Right? Right. So that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's an Urdu, right? Yes, yes. Right. And if you trans, I mean, there are probably speakers of Urdu better than I am in this group. Uh, but if you can, my understanding is that word translates to a space for precious stuff. Yes, of course. Could, right. So yeah. you see a slight difference in the emphasis already. In one interpretation, it is a space for letters. In another interpretation, it's a space for precious stuff. In Tamil, which is my native uh, language, I think the word is avana kapagam, uh, which broadly translates to uh, kapagam as safety, 
Avana space. So it's a space for, you know, it's a safe space for stuff. Right? So safety is an emphasis here. Any other languages? But one of the reasons I do this is that the reality is for many of us, we struggle with also knowing what the word is in our own language. And I think this is a fault not of yours or not of anyone's thing. It's just the fault of the world of the archives in general that you know archivists and archives haven't done as an interesting job of communicating what they are about to the communities that they inhabit in. Every one of you has probably visited, we've all visited libraries. Um, we've visited galleries, we've visited museums. Um, you know, across the country, there is this whole push for making more museums. But an archive, which is fundamental to all of these spaces, is somehow not as captured in our imagination. So, uh, but I really want you to think, I mean, have a look at what you, in your own, in the languages that you know, or in you know, other languages that are around you, what is the word for, for an archive? And I think it's it, this is an important question because if you ask yourself, what is the word archive? Where does it come from in English? Uh, does anybody have a sense of where that might come from in English? But I mean, you don't need to, but I'm asking genuinely. Naveed, um, if I may, I want to call on you because I noticed you had mentioned institutional repositories. Can you just clarify what your question is here, if you're on the chat, or if you can just speak? Naveed Akhtar? Okay, I'm not sure if this person's around. Um, so, my fundamental when I when I ask you the question of probing the archive, and I'm asking, you know, what is it? What is an archive in your words? And you know, uh, we've talked about it being a center for culture and heritage. We've talked about it being um, a site for retrieval, uh, a site that is organized well, a site of memory, a site of historical records. Uh, and in terms of past, present, and future, we've you know we've had various words. You know we've had the idea of it being past. Chandana talked about it being a repository of stories. We've also seen it being as an example of something that can be a combination of all three: past, present, and future. But the more and more you do this, I don't. It's not that there is a particular answer to this question, right? It's not like I can give you a, a statement to say an archive is only this, but if we critically ask these questions, then we realize that we start to complicate and understand the same word in different ways, that we don't take something for granted. Now, uh, Shuli raised a, has an, raised an interesting point in the chat. Uh, uh, Shuli, if you don't mind, can I just call on you uh, to you know maybe just come on the mic if you can, to just clarify a little bit about what you mean by using it in our present scenario. You said that we are collecting resources of historical importance, using it in the present scenario, and preserving it for the future. What do you mean by Hello. using it in the present scenario? Actually, we are uh, collecting the resources. If we need any information regarding our any research projects or other issues, we can use the information from those um, archives. Got it. Got it. OK, fine. That's our present uh, purpose. And right. if, if we can preserve those resources, for the future generation, they can also get uh, benefited from those resources. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, if I if I change this question a little bit, you know, I asked you what an archive is. Now, if I change this question, because you know, I think Chandana has used the word stories. Now, if I reverse this question and I ask you, well, what is a story? Right. Not usually, but generally, to all of you. And honestly, guys, just help me out uh, we're going to try and use the microphone if you have access to it um, i would encourage you to use it because otherwise it's just you know a single person speaking um, and this is not what we would do if we're face to face you know in a non pandemic conference no so what do you think a story is again 
Sounds like a very simple question. But I want you to think about this. Whatever comes to mind. What's the story? Sir, uh, stories uh, about individual or institutions? Sure. But what is what is a story? I mean, it's a very, I'm not complicating it. It's not a trick question. I'm just genuinely asking, you know, what 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 is for us a story? What, you know, uh, what, what is a characteristic culture, of a story? Individual culture or institutional culture. Right. But what, huh, okay, that's a good idea. So what are the other characteristics of a story? You know, we use this word a story a lot. You know, yes, sir. What, what do we think a story is? So story could be something which has already happened or it's happening. It's it's kind of it could it could it could be a real fact or it could be a fiction. It could be also some fiction. So uh, it's 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 a kind of a record or uh, or a figment of imagination, whatever we say actually that, that if it is documented okay. like the thing which which has got some basic things like we have some characters and we have some uh, some something to say and we document it and I, I think right. that's a story. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. So the reason I'm asking this question is to basically ask, well, what is an archive and what is a story, right? Uh, we seem to use these words, but can we ask ourselves, what do we in in the in based on our own experiences, based on what we have seen of the world, what is a library? What is an archive? What is a story? You know, this is just three broad, simple questions. And, you know, not I'm not looking for a textbook sort of definition of it, just our, on our own experiences. What is the distinction? So, say for, uh, so sir, distinction, I, I can't, I, I, because I, I, I don't know or how to figure it out at this moment. Sure. No, that's so, fine. Sir, actually, I am from a from my background, actually, sir, I'm a math, math teacher, actually. So, that's perfect. Perfect. Or, there is no, there is no requirement for any background in this from, so from as a mathematician, what do you, yes, you know, what is your imagination of a story? So, so you know, that I can really, really tell, sir. Actually, for me, a story is basically, basically what we are, suppose that we are writing a research paper. So, we are writing whatever the things which we suppose that it, it should happen. Suppose mm -hmm. that we are, uh, we, are uh, we are devising some theory. So, mm -hmm. uh, based, on, based on the theory, we are placing some points on the favor of some logic. So, ultimately, I also think there is a kind of a story which we are writing. Like, uh, it, it's some logical facts which, which I am incorporating. And based on the truth of the facts, then I am then I'm concluding that, okay, this is the truth which is going to happen. Okay. And then I am supporting it, it, it with some examples and with some, with, with some figures and diagrams. So, Fantastic. that is also a kind of a story, I think. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Thank you. Actually, I'm so glad you brought up the idea of mathematics because, you know, we don't normally think of mathematics as being stories, but as you have very rightly pointed out, your... Sir, actually, least... in my classes also, sir, whenever I am teaching in my classes, I am using stories to tell, uh, to teach mathematics. Unless, right. un unless and unless, uh, until and unless a student visualizes what, whatever the things I am teaching, he or she will be just seeing alphabet So, I have to Figure it out that alpha is something, beta is something, and gamma is something. There are some players, and they are playing, playing some matches on this. Like like that kind of thing. I, I I always build up some stories with some mathematical using mathematical tools, and uh, and I give it to the brains of, of of my students. So that is how they can just picturize it with either geometrically or in physical world. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's use your mathematics example, right? You know, for this audience, let's just take a very famous person. Let's just say someone like Ramanujam, just because a name that is familiar to people in other disciplines. Okay. Um, and let's just say that there is a paper or a letter that Ramanujam had written, right? Um, is that a name that people know of? I mean, please show of hands. I mean, just put it in the chat to ask. There are, you know, there's no need for you to have known this, but uh, Dr. Sarkar, you can obviously put that in the chat. You can just, if no one knows, you can just clarify who Ramanujam was or something. Just to put a name out, it doesn't really matter. So let's just say that there is um, a research paper that, um, Ramanujan wrote, okay? And all of you understand the idea of a research paper because you're all in some research institute or the others. So you understand that research papers are a way in which your academic work is judged. Now, a research paper, as Dr. Sarkar has said now, is a way of thinking about, you know, from the perspective, is, is a story. Okay. Now, if you ask yourself, 
what are the elements that go into the making of a research paper um, in, in whatever field it is. And the elements that go into the making of a paper would include things like lab notes, field notes, uh, letters, photographs, analysis, uh, first draft, revisions, all sorts of other things. And then eventually you distill it down to something called a research paper. Fine. And that's what you know a peer reviewed journal sees, and then they evaluate, and then they publish it. But out of all of this, if you ask, where is the story? Where is the archive? If you start to probe this just a little bit and see the research paper is basically a story. And a story is generally, it's nice to see a story, to think of a story as a way to construct meaning from data. Right? So you have a variety of data sources. And you thread a narrative. You you push. You put something together to construct a narrative based on a variety of data sources that are available to you. And that, in a sense, that is one, you know, way of thinking about stories. And if you do that, you realize that the latest Bollywood thriller and a research paper have something in common. They are both trying to construct meaning from some data very broadly put. They're both different kinds of stories. Yes, they, have exactly. they have different audiences. They have different constituencies. But they're both using some ingredients in their recipe. And those ingredients objects, in a sense, are archival objects. Are objects, some of which might be sitting in an archive, like a Muhafiz Khan. And some of them may not be sitting in an archive. They might be sitting, you know, on your WhatsApp chat, whatever it is. Now, if this is a relation between a story and an archive, let me change the question and ask you, which came first, the story or the archive? I'm asking this in general to everyone. Sir, for me, I think stories came first. OK. Anybody else agree, disagree? There are no right or wrong answers to this one. What comes first, the story or the archive? Sir, uh, I was just thinking of some impact. So suppose that there is some story in my mind. And then when I'm carving or I'm craving, sorry, sir, I'm using a stone in a cave. Just, 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 just think of the scenario in, in, in that uh, pyramids and those persons who used to engraft those uh, their stories in the walls of those up there. Up there. So we have some archives, uh, but but but, but, but for that, there were stories coming into their mind. So the moment they are uh, building uh, or they are writing something on the on the walls of the caves, they are those, those people of uh, the Egypt. So once it has been written in the cave, I think it's becoming an archive. Otherwise, it is a story which is just uh, coming from one person to another. Okay. I'm going to, I mean, hold on to that thought about how something becomes an archive because we're going to get to that in a moment or two. But I just want to probe this question a little further. You have said story. A couple of other people in the chat have also, they also believe that a story comes before the archive. But, you know, I disagree. But we'll talk about it. Any, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, Actually, my, uh, whatever has come to my mind would match with the uh, uh I would rather say it's, it's oral tradition, which is story and archive put together. Right. Okay. I'll come back to this idea of put together in a moment also, because yeah. that is sort of going in a direction that I want to probe. And that's part of the probing the archive sort of session. But any anybody else who wants to take a shot at this, you know, what do you think, you know, does something come first? Uh, you know, it's I realize it's a little bit like a chicken and egg question. And that's really sir, the intention sir, for this I question. Was, yes, sir. Actually, sir, I was pondering something. Sir, I have heard that I said, I, please correct me if I'm wrong. And I have that heard that Vedas were trans uh, were transferred only by hearing. Somebody the, the gurus used to teach, and the peoples used to hear, and then the, the same traditions went, went went on without writing. So if it if that is true, then shall I just call that those things as archives, just like in the memory? If some if something is just re residing in someone's memory in an organized manner, so shall I call it is a, it is a story or an archive? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, this is getting into the idea of semantics to some degree. So I don't, I mean, so I don't know anything about the Vedas, uh, but you're right. It could be both. Um, and 
the point that it's not so you you raised this question about something being written or not written and rajesh has also mentioned this idea about oral tradition so you know it's it's a good point that you know because in some of our languages in india we seem to lay emphasis on the written record you know because we literally call the archive as a space for written stuff but obviously we know when you probe the archive carefully that an archive is not only about written stuff right so amrita has you know raised a valid point the stories will have to be there to be archived something has to exist in the first place to be documented or recorded amrita can you clarify this if you're able to use your microphone i just want to understand what are you, what are you inferring from this what are you trying to say are you saying that the stories precede the archive yes sir i just meant that there has to be something for us to record the stories may be verbal uh, the stories may not be written as you said but there has to be something otherwise what do we record it's all started with one story perhaps but then mm-hmm. there has to be that one story which will then be archived and then the idea of archive ar- archiving will start i mean okay, okay. i just it just came to my mind like this yeah okay so here is sir, you know hello sir hello sir it's just a something yeah. again it's coming is coming on to my mind uh, because uh, i am just thinking what about fossils because fossils are not made by us so suppose mm-hmm. we are uh, we uh, the archaeologists are discovering some fossils so mm-hmm. those 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 fossils are also telling some stories otherwise but but but, but those fossils are already documented right some in, mm-hmm. in some stones or in some way or like nature or natural archives which what to be discovered day by day by day so nature mm-hmm. i think is it is creating its its own archive before mankind has to discover it. so if okay. if we are thinking it in the reverse way then then, then we can also say that okay that first the archives were there and then we are just making our own narratives Okay, so I. But then um, it will be an addition can... to the archive, rather than creation of the archive. It will be an addition to the existing uh, records, right? What Shubhati Das has said. I agree. Yeah. So, I, so um, Shubhati, what you have said, if you can just bring this point up later, because I think it's an important one to clarify about what is an archive and what is not, and what are the characteristics of an archive. So, if you don't mind, just remember to bring this question up about the fossil record later. because this comes up quite often when 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 i share ideas about the archive i want to just come back to what amrita just said uh, and i'll come back to what you said later if you don't mind because amrita has raised this point about there has to be something to be recorded um, so fun fact because i think if i if you take a story for instance right let's just say um, i was speaking to another group uh, earlier today uh and we were talking about the farmers movement protests that uh, have been taking place in north india mostly and of course across india as well um and they'd raised this question about you know they're creating a farmers movement archive so this is something that they've been working on and one of the things that they raised in that um is you know where they are um, archiving the verb i'm not using the noun i'm using the verb they are archiving uh facebook or social media posts from individuals and such okay so now when you start asking and you say you know getting to amrita's point that something has to be there in the first place so let's take something very specific instead of talking in the broad let's take a facebook post because you know we're talking and but i'm just using this it doesn't have to be facebook let's you know it could be a letter i am deliberately going to stay away from talking about anything digital because i think that takes us away from the core of the conversation so if you take a facebook post or if you take a letter or if you take you know an inscription in a cave or whatever it might be this is a record someone has put something out there but as shubhati had mentioned a little while back nothing amrita has pointed out where does that story come from you know if we say that a story comes before the archive my question back to you is well where does the story come from and as you have said amrita you said that something has to exist for the story to be recorded now where does it exist in this case let's imagine that you know you write a letter or someone writes an inscription in a cave or someone writes a facebook post or someone posts something on instagram or one of you sends a message on whatsapp right now telling a friend of yours what a ridiculous workshop session this is whatever it is all of these are examples of a record but where does that story come from i mean not it's not a trick question yeah i mean the story comes from some sort of a reaction to the event that is in question 
correct right that, so uh, the reaction is psychological or emotional it cannot exactly. be recorded so that is recorded in the form of some sort of in the, that the physical manifestation of that reaction is what we will say right so exactly so this reaction so in a sense what i think one of you had alluded to earlier that the archive in a sense it's useful to think of this entire process starting in one's imagination okay so imagine yes. a word if you think of its origins uh, and again you know i do this a lot because i think it's useful for us to understand where words come from you know because words are the way we communicate with each other imagine comes from image where the mind has an an image or a picture of something to you know literally put so you know we already are starting to use visual aids in our own minds at least that is how etymologically this word is used so the archive always always begins in one's imagination okay now yes now is the image in our mind an archive or a story well it's probably a combination of both as rajashri had sort of pointed out a little while back from that process there is a desire to communicate we communicate orally we communicate by writing something on a wall in a cave we write something on a tablet on a paper on a ipad like which is a new tablet so to speak or whatever or a phone we use all kinds of devices the medium keeps changing over the ages but there is a desire to communicate to record record by the way origins uh, it's a fun thing that we, I mean, we may not always realize a record is re re means to do something again cord comes from cordus which is the heart so which is you know the same origins as cardiac or as cardiology they have the same origins so this was from a time when we historically thought that committing to the heart was a way to commit to memory so the seat of the mind was thought to be in the heart which is why the phrase learning something by heart comes into play so or the word document the word document means to learn so there is an there is an origin here to say that you know to document something is to be able to learn something from this process so all of these processes you know what starts in the imagination starts to be recorded and then there's a systematic way in which we are going from imagination to something that's recorded in and this record can be called a story in the moment but a few years or a few decades or a few centuries or in the case of as uh, what we have just spoken about a few thousand years later we look at it again and we ask ourselves is this an object of the archive right now yes um i see dipya is here hey dipya welcome Hey Venkat, good to see you. Hey, good to see you, man. Uh, we're we're doing a super informal session on probing the archive. So yeah, I'm listening. In. I'm listening. In. Please feel free to contest all theories being expounded. <laughs> anyway, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't contest an expert. <laughs> but anyway, so this question of you know when we're talking about probing, so then when we ask this question of what comes first, the story or the archive, we realize that this question is a meaningless question. because they have a certain symbiotic relation with each other and the question could be reframed as that first thing that comes up do we see that as an archive or do we see that as a story and that this is a perception question so this is all i was trying to say that's why there are no right or wrong answers to it it's really a question of how we invert the lens but if we start systematically but it is very important in today's age to not confuse the two at any given moment every object every facebook post every whatsapp thread every annual report every website has a characteristic of an archival object has a characteristic of a story but these two should not be confused with each other we should know what is the perception or the lens with which we are seeing it and this is something that you know sounds like the obvious thing to say but i think the reality is that very often we confuse the story for the archive and the archive for the story i don't know this this is making sense uh, but this is an just a critical point to think about systematically as we think about archival objects so this is just one large point i wanted to raise right in the beginning because before we you know when you enter an archive you know as a researcher you will enter an archive or as an archivist you will be creating archives or as a you know as a member of some policy making group you will be relying on researchers who use archives to frame policies that you will enact it's always useful to be skeptical about both the archive and the narrative that you're being um uh, dished out and ask ourselves what is the archive here what is the story what is the distinction between the two 
is is a critical aspect that we need to understand so now if i just take an example of an object i'm just going to share my screen for a moment because now that i have said talked to you about what the story is what the archive is a very obvious thing to ask is how do you, what is the relation between these two worlds how do you think something goes from being an archive to being a story again not complicated its answers are very simple i don't you don't have to think too much about it but what what do you think the process is from going from an archival object to a story probably see my screen yes i'm just taking this object that i use often just as an example but you can take any object this object sits in the archive at ncbs it's a letter it's an archival object there's a story inside it there are stories that come from it this object also comes from other stories so very simply this object this letter that you're looking at is a letter that started is a letter written by this gentleman named narayan karangya who if you go to the top sorry if you can read it it will be great if you can't i'm happy to share but it's a letter written in 1990 from this person and a letter written to the bombay natural history society and this letter says i'd gone through this pamphlet called the vanishing floricans which is a, a particular kind of bird you don't need to worry about that but this person is a farmer who's interested in you know working on nature is talking about you know citing this bird in the air and noting how it flew noting when it came in the winter and basically saying that i would like to help in any you know within their own way and saying i'm looking forward to hearing from you in some measure okay so on the face of it it's a letter what's going on here though what's what just happened this is a letter that is sitting in the archive at ncbs you know it has a fancy thing called an archival id it's got a citation note but this person narayan karangya nobody knows him in this group probably uh, we also don't know him is a person who now sits who has an archival document sitting in the archive and my question to you is how did we go from what what just happened here where does the archive begin for this going back to amrita's point the archive begins in narayan's imagination right it begins in the moment when narayan went through the pamphlet titled the florican okay it begins so that moment is lodged in this person's mind then narayan is out in the field in 1990 or you know a few months before that perhaps and citing something a bird called the florican in that moment narayan is connecting citing the florican and the pamphlet in the in his mind and he is connecting the dots and he's making this extra effort he is deciding to communicate right and he is deciding to write this letter he can't i don't to the best of a knowledge he can't write in english so he realizes he uses someone else's help someone else's help to write in english and send this word out to the bombay natural history society and writes this out at that moment there is a set of events that happens right this is the first documentation outside the mind going from one's imagination to this thing called paper in the form of a record committing to heart but also committing to paper from that moment on there is a set of events that happens the bnhs the bombay natural history society for reasons only known to them have then decided to keep the letter they didn't destroy it right it's not like narayan karangya's abdul kalam right so they just decided to keep the letter and they sent it to the ornithologist who worked on these birds ravi sankaran ravi sankaran kept the letter did not reply back because we spoke to narayan karangya later but for some reason kept the letter in his folders and went around the country after that he then went on to become the director of another institute moved around the country had you know had a tragic accident no tragic um, passing away in 2009 his papers moved around place to place went from you know bombay to coimbatore and so on and so forth from there they went to madras and then his family reached out to the archive at ncbs saying you know we have some papers would you like them the archive at ncbs went to his house picked up a whole bunch of folders of ravi sankaran and found this letter and then made a decision that this should enter an archive and then it decided it's going to go ahead and describe it so the transition from imagination to a story called a letter 
and the story called a letter then eventually reaches a whole bunch of other objects that become available to an archive for a process called appraisal a process of evaluation which is always biased that process of appraisal and evaluation leads to the selection selection is a key word and these are word these are selection of objects that enter an archive in other words these are the objects that have been chosen to exist and to stay alive there are for every object that stays alive quote unquote there are 99 others that are erased from history or erased from memory and this is an important point to remember because very often people may say that an archive is a space that can keep everything and so this question of what is everything what is something and what is a little has to be thought about so there's a decision made here about what enters and then the archive goes about adding ways of entry so you might call it hashtag you might call it semantic web link data whatever the phrase is but these are all each of these things you know we call it metadata all of these things are points of entry you know the word jamnagar you know is a point of entry for someone who is looking for some history related to jamnagar the word farmer the word conservation the word letter the word uh, pamphlet the word birds the word advocacy all of these are ways in which we are able to engage and interact with this in other words each and every one of these words is a layer of interpretation it's a way in which we look at the object as archivists and say here are ways in which we can allow make basically what we are doing is we are creating multiple doors to the object and that is what an archive typically does it provides some context to the material some process around the material so that with researchers like yourself can access through those doors so if you look at this box think of this box as being this metaphorical cage for the archival object and think of each of these as being entry points to the object right i it sounds like i'm stating something very obvious but it's very important to remember that this relation between the story and the archive is made possible through these layers of interpretation that we very routinely call hashtags or whatever it is today but if we probe every one of these we'll see what the politics of the archive are just in this simple framework of the story the database and the narrative thinking about points of entry and exit because each of these so for instance if jamnagar is now a point of entry it allows someone like amrita to look for something like jamnagar and then use this particular letter to talk about the history of agriculture in jamnagar and use this as part of her interpretation which has nothing to do with the way this archival object entered ncbs in the first place it entered through these papers through the papers of a scientist working on birds but it allows someone like amrita to use this in a way that is completely irrelevant to sankaran's research on birds does this sort of framing make sense or have i lost you guys completely I think the answer is lost you guys completely. No. It's so very simple. I think but, we all are in a learning mode and mood so therefore answer is not right. particularly So clear. I so in in the remaining 5 minutes or so that we have I mean I realize because I mean uh, probing the archive is a very large sort of space but getting the way I want you to think about you know when you when you engage with an archive is to ask some of these very basic questions to say well what is the relation between the story and the archive to acknowledge that they have a certain symbiotic relationship with each other the second is to think a little bit about what is where, where is the dynamism of the archive you know very people people often say that an archive is a space for historical material it's a space to capture the past for future generations and all of this makes sense but if we ask ourselves more carefully how is that possible where is that being you know made possible we realize that that is being done through these interpretive layers that we very freely these days call metadata or cataloging or bucketing right but this bucketing this ability to look at the material and say this object speaks to me not just about conservation but also about advocacy it also speaks to me about something else right that ability of bucketing is what allows the archival object to constantly live going forward without that ability to constantly see challenge and reimagine the object imagine again the same word that we spoke about earlier we are stuck with a very dead um, approach to the archive 
the other point that I want to connect here is what is the actual, you know, very often people would say that an archive in a sense is, is a space that is, is an unbiased approach to historical material. And which is to some degree, you could argue it's fine. And so, but once you realize that there is such a strong relation between the story and the archive, you can immediately realize, because I think one of you had mentioned that if something needs to be documented or recorded, that is the moment in which an object is created, a story is created for the world to see, and then it has a chance of entering an archive. But if you ask yourself systematically, if the archive is really that unbiased or, you know, um, it, it's a space that doesn't judge what enters, then the quest, some of the questions connected to this are, what is the reason for a particular archive not having the histories of a particular community or a particular individual or a particular discipline? Why is it so hard to find histories around Dalit, I mean, um, um, Dalit communities in the National Archives of India? It is, not, it is not as though the archive is going out of its way to exclude people. That is, I mean, it doesn't, an archive doesn't go in with a particular intention like that. You know, Derrida has famously said that an archive, you know, if I'm not mistaken, says something about it not having intention. And a it's a phrase that I disagree with. I, I'd like to think of an archive as having a million different intentions. But the point here is the archive is not going with an intent to exclude. But as I said initially, that for every object that you preserve, there are 99 others that you choose to erase or not have. You start to realize that an archive's primary role is erasure. You're making decisions of what will not enter in your very process of curation and selection. And so when you start systematically building archives or when you start engaging or interrogating archives, a useful question to always ask is what didn't enter? What did not make the archive? Right. Um, to challenge and to question, to say, and to realize that an archive will always be an incomplete space, as well as story. The only way to compensate for this is to just have a variety of different archives and a variety of different stories that are accessible to you. Um, there was one last point, I guess. No, I think I'll just stop here just to see if there are any other questions because I know we're a few minutes left for the beer stock. Just sharing a quick observation here. Not only, hello. Oh, yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, totally agree with you. And but I believe just not only the uh, process of curation and selection, the very uh, categorization and hierarchical order of the archiving is also very, uh, is a very much political. Uh, so therefore, it. Uh, I mean, it uh, definitely has some intention. I mean, look at those institutions who, ha who have the archive. Who are they? Why do not other institutions do not have the archive? And the... Uh, if I may, I, I do, uh, I agree with what you're saying, that there's a political act and archives are always political spaces, but I think it's useful to also not think of the word politics in the lens that it has. You know, again, going back to words and where they come from, politics, polity is about people. Right? It, it shares an origin with the word police. It has it, it shares an you know, origin with the word political. And so it's useful to for us to broaden. And this is actually a key point that I need to make. And I think I'll wrap with this. Um, Chabati had earlier mentioned about fossil record. And, you know, we have to think a little bit about what an archive is and isn't. Now, if you have something like, you know, cave paintings, or if you have, say, someone who has a, um, you know, a seed bank or a rice bank or whatever it is. Now, these by on their own could also be seen as archives. But I think the characteristic of an archive is that archiving is a human endeavor. And I cannot stress this enough. Archives capture context and process of individuals, institutions, corporations, movements, communities, whatever it is, but there is the ar the archive. You can call anything an archive. You can call the cave paintings an archive, but that does not, it does not really become an archive in my opinion, in my very limited opinion, unless A, you capture context and process. You include 
to some degree, the processes around the archaeologists or the geologists who have worked in these spaces. You collect those conversations as part of that record. B, unless you're able to imbue and add those different points of entry, points of entry can be called metadata, whatever it is, you allow for it to inhabit in the future. And as I keep saying um, over and over again till <laughs> I go hold, that archives are here to enable a diversity of stories. Enable, enable, not tell. So you, you, you catapult, you position material in a way that is valuable uh, going forward. So archiving is a political act, but I think the word politic, the word bias, these words, if they are made transparent, if you illustrate what your processes have been in the making of the archive, you allow for a certain reversibility, then I think the archive is a strong institution because then it's very clear where it stands and it allows for another community to position an archive, you know, as a response to yours, or you know, as as you know, an amplifier to your archive, to some degree. So I just wanted to sort of qualify that word politics to some degree. It's at four thirty. I should stop. Thank you so much, Benkat, for this uh, engaging session on archiving. Now let us. Uh... Welcome, Dr. Dibbudutti Roy. Chandana? Is, is Dr. Chandana Singh here? No, I'm here, Rashida. Uh, a formal introduction is in order, please. Uh -huh, okay. Um, Rajoshi, can I start uh, sharing screen just Thank to check? You. Uh, let me allow to invite our for, uh, speaker of this session, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dibbaduti Roy. He is an assistant professor of media, communication and cultural studies, Department of Humanities and Social Science, Digital Humanities Division of Interdisciplinary Research, School of Management and Entrepreneurship, India Institute of Technology, Jodhpur. Welcome, sir. Over to sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rajoshi, and thank you, Dr. Singh, for inviting me. Uh, my it name is, is Dibbo. Your presentation is visible and you are audible, sir. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, please don't call me, sir. I'm quite uncomfortable with that word, but thank you so much for that honorific. Um, yeah. So I first want to. Uh, mention uh, and congratulate Rajoshi and Banwari Lal Bhalotia College for having such a fabulous event and uh, hearing my good friend and colleague and someone I learned from regularly, Venkat, reminds me of the reason we do these things, right? To keep the conversations going. And, uh, you know, we share a lot of interests and because we have limited time, I won't really be levered the point. Uh, my talk today is called humanistic research and or in digitality, it's called with the subtitle or the sort of uh, rejoinder or parenthesis saying crisis confabulations and context. A quick introduction has been given by Dr. Singh. So I won't really go into who I am further. If you want, I can discuss that while it's not relevant to the talk today. Right. So um, I, I work at IIT Jodhpur and my talk today begins largely and my work with DH, although it started very early on in my PhD career, really got sort of an impetus when in 2016, a group of us who were interested in what we understand to be digital humanities, which is of course very different in India than in the global north. Um, we decided that uh, this conversations need to be brought together. And at my previous institution, which was IIM Indore, uh, my co-organizer, Dr. Nirmala Menon and I, we were very fortunate to organize India's first open CFP-based DH conference at IIM Indore. At that point of time, we were called the Digital Humanities Alliance of India. And uh, sorry, I, uh, yeah, Digital Humanities Alliance of India. And at that event, we got participation from 15 Indian states and five countries. And essentially what we understood was uh, the diversity of digital humanities in this country is far and very wide ranging. And uh, we sort of re christened ourselves uh, from, from Dhai to Dharti in 2018, around that time. 
and this is largely due to bureaucratic reasons because when you're registering you're not allowed to use the word india in your title and we can talk about nomenclature later on we also were very fortunate to organize india's first twitter conference in january of 2020 just before the pandemic and i just also want to lead you towards or direct you towards the 30 2022 conference which is coming up in february of this year and uh, the deadline is november 30 for submission of panels proposals workshop ideas so i would strongly encourage all of you who are present here to go forward and put in a proposal as you can see on the right hand side there's maya who's retweeted this i believe maya spoke yesterday at this conference and i will put the link in the chat box or i'll request rajoshi to share that uh, with us we also have a whatsapp group we are across all social media so as a founding member i would request you to sort of amplify and move forward with this and we look forward to receiving your submissions um, moving forward today my talk the key provocations of my talk uh, emerge from this sort of binary in digital humanities on the left hand side some, somewhat facetiously i've mentioned this nam to sunahi hoga this is what we digital humanists believe that everyone knows and hears about digital humanities all the time and the other side, there's this meme which says, say digital humanities one more goddamn time. So in between this binary or this sort of paradox, we situate ourselves and we find this contestation to be productive. At least I do. I feel this contestation about digital humanities, uh, whether the normative nature of digital humanities and the sort of contested nature of digital humanities, these are things that we need to keep in mind while moving forward. And we don't, we don't need to sort of believe that digital humanities is here it's sort of replaced other formats. So that's something what my talk is going to talk about today. So I divided it broadly into three parts. It's called crisis and the humanities, confabulations and the print paradigm. And then we go into context, why digital humanities, DH in India and paths forward. As you'll see, I've mentioned just key provocations because I hope these will provoke new queries and new inquiries in your mind. So that's with that hope I move forward, right? So I believe many of you might have noticed these kind of narratives in social media, mass media, print media, that there is a crisis in the humanities, right? So there's an article here from the Harvard Crimson. There's an article here from the Atlantic, which says students are abandoning humanities majors, turning to degrees dating yield far better job prospects. And here it says that they're wrong, but there's a frontline article from 2017, which talks about the crisis in humanities as well. And I'm sure many of us have heard this and talked about it and discussed you know, how sadly the nostalgia for a good old time when humanities was established and people believed in humanistic inquiry. So let's start with this idea of the crisis in the humanities and then move on to uh, understanding what exactly is the humanities, right? What is humanities? So what do the humanities do? So the firstly, the humanities are about what is what it is to be human. And I love the fact that you just, you know, um, when Venkat talks about archives enabling stories, right? So the humanities enable humans, right? So it's about understanding others in the world through their languages, histories, cultures. They foster social justice and equality. They teach empathy. The humanities teach us to deal critically and logically with subjective, complex, imperfect, chaotic information. And we'll come into humanistic data a little later on. They teach us to weigh evidence skeptically and consider more than one side of every question. Great. But what does this mean in everyday words, right? How does this operationalize a word that we are very, um, you know, sort of we use very often in social sciences. So a, a key aspect of humanistic inquiry is the development of what we understand to be cultural logic. What is cultural logic? Cultural logic is the process through which people collectively use effectively identical assumptions in interpreting each other's actions. And this is called cultural logic. So this is a key aspect of humanistic inquiry. I'm not saying this is the only aspect of humanistic inquiry, but this is the aspect of humanistic inquiry that I'm going to operationalize in today's talk. And the question is, how is this cultural logic identified, right? How is this identified? And a question that I keep getting asked is, what is, uh, does humanities have any methodology? Of course we do, right? So methodology is something that is not extrinsic, but rather integral and intrinsic to humanities. And the very common methodology, there are many, but one of the most common methodologies of doing this is reading. Right. So reading all of those human artifacts, actions or ideas that have urgent meaning for us in the present. So I would like to draw your attention to the words that have sort of bolded or emphasized and used in a different color. Reading human artifacts, actions or ideas that have urgent meaning for us in the present. 
So there is an urgency, there is a context. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the urgent human artifacts, actions or ideas that have been there historically. Right? What are some of these? Okay. And to talk about that, we will talk about this word confabulations and the print paradigm. What does confabulations mean? So Merriam Webster defines confabulations as to fill in gaps in memory by fabrication. Now, this sounds like, again, to sort of bring in this uh, conversation on politics, this sounds as if this is a deliberate act. But often uh, confabulations aren't deliberate acts. They happen because one paradigm or one structure becomes so normative that it tells us that this is how you fill in the gaps. Even though those gaps aren't factual, those gaps should be interrogated. Those gaps need to be actually filled in with other forms of contextual information. But we do it for, through a form of fabrication. So a deliberate forgetting, if you may, if you, if you may sort of term it that. So that leads me to three artifacts, right? Three artifacts that at that point of time that had urgency and allowed us to understand human action, ideas. So three artifacts that I've put in front of you today are the six pillar edicts of Ashoka 238 BC, the Sogara copper plate inscription, which is the earliest known of its kind, third century BC, and a Kashmiri manuscript birch brach from 17th century. So uh, I would request that, um, you know, take about a minute and I request the audience members to tell me what are these, you know, what could be one word that connects all of them. I'll give you 30 seconds if you could put that in the chat box. What's one word that connects one of them? And the hint I'll give you is reading is connected to them. So 30 seconds if you want to put it in your chat box. Vaishali says feedback, but I don't imagine could be feedback. I think she means something else for feedback for the session. But in general, I think, uh, sure, I think we could also use the word feedback and talk about it, a feedback loop in the communication Shannon Weaver model. But uh, any any responses from the audience? There's about 63 or 60 people in the room right now. Any Any perceptions? What's the one word that would connect these three artifacts for you? Akula says, hello, hello, hello back. Um, yeah, any responses? Right, so maybe like the last five seconds, history, stories, narratives, Amrita says. Great, Amrita. So history, stories, narratives, absolutely. That's what they are leading towards. But what we would bring it down to at the core, these are documents enabling reading. So the reading allows those history, stories, and narratives to be formed. But these are documents enabling reading. And I'm sure immediately there are some skeptics in the room who'd say, oh, well, these are not documents. Documents are always paper based, right? Documents mean folders, files. And uh, if you have that in mind, that's great. But that's something we'll try and contest today. So a book that I would strongly recommend for you and towards uh, today's talk, this is Lisa Gittleman's Paper Knowledge, a 2014 book, which calls towards a media history of documents. So in that, Gittleman says that the word document descends from the Latin word docere to teach or show any object once it is framed becomes a document. So the framing of it, something you discussed uh, in the last session with Venkat, with Venkat very beautifully brought into the play, the points of entry, right? The, the documents allowed us are, are allowed to exist through framing or through setting up, right? So the documents are always tied to specific settings. That's very, very important to keep in mind. And Documents have existed longer than books, paper, printing, or the public sphere. So that's very, very important to remember that documents are not, not tied into only the print paradigm. They've existed, in fact, far longer than books, paper, printing, or even the public sphere in a very Hebermasian notion of the public sphere arising from Parisian salons, which, of course, has been critiqued. So this is something that I want to emphasize, and uh, I hope everyone keeps this in mind as we move forward that the word documents or the general normative, the confabulation of documents as only being based in paper paradigms is something that is based out of this print paradigm, which is a relatively recent phenomenon, which comes in with Gutenberg and his printing press. Again, I'm sort of uh, using the normative Western paradigm of Gutenberg. Of course, printing itself has existed before 
Gutenberg comes into fray in, in China and other places. But because the Gutenberg is tied with the Enlightenment narrative and Gutenberg and the printing press become very popular, um, this has become the normative understanding of print and reading, in fact. So reading then gets tied with the print paradigm, the paper paradigm, and then gets tied in with our print born assumptions that shape our social, political, economic, and especially academic structures. But the question then is, do we even read the same way, right? So my point of contention would be, we rarely read books even the same way. And this is not actually my contention. This is from a beautiful essay by Matthew Kirschenbaum called The Remaking of Reading, where he talks that even reading happens on different registers. If there's a really, really good pulp fiction or a bestseller, we might read it from cover to cover. Uh, when you're reading a conference abstract like the ELAN one, you will read excerpts or selections based on your interest. When you go to a magazine stand, you'll probably be grazing or browsing through something. When you're going through a textbook trying to read for an exam, you skim, you scan. Um, often you have to speed read when you're driving and you look up at signals, you quickly need to see directions or which way to move, you speed read. And the last one might not be uh, familiar to some of you, but I think maybe familiar the idea of reference, right? So reference libraries where you couldn't actually pick up the books from the catalog, or we couldn't pick up big book, books from the shelf and look up the reference. So what does this lead us to? This leads up to the idea that in a world where there are only 50 to 60 million books, this is across the uh, Chinese library, the British library, the library of Congress, um, we have 50 to 60 million books and we have 1.72 billion websites. This is 2019 data, which I'm sure has increased, has uh, probably exceeded 2 billion. So there are 2 billion, if we take that, there are 2 billion websites in the world right now. Uh, do we then say that humanistic inquiry needs to be limited to the print paradigm to only books? No. So the associated question that quickly comes in is, does this imply the death of traditional humanistic models of closed reading? In a sense, this could be sort of the question that drives the conversation on my topic today, that does then the, the coming of websites, the coming of digital media, does it imply the death of traditional humanistic models of closed reading? Well, no, but we need to acknowledge that knowledge networks do not begin or end with, uh, do not end or begin with the printing press and digital platforms are significant documents of the post-print era, right? This post-print era, this word has been framed by uh, Jessica Pressman and Kathleen Hales in a book they write called Comparative Textual Media, which is also something that I would recommend that you have a look at. So again, they are documents which are basically framed within a particular setting, and the setting is post-print. So digital platforms become a site for humanistic inquiry. And this leads us to this key point that documents are materialities enabling humanistic inquiry, and it does not equal only the close reading of the print printed artifact or the print paradigm, right? So that's a confabulation. That's something that we use in our mind to sort of fill in the gaps in our memory because we are not trying to go further enough or far enough. So therefore, the discipline of humanities is not the history of only close reading the book or print culture. Please understand at no point of time am I trying to discount print culture or I'm trying to, I grew up myself as uh, someone who was entwined in print culture. I still am to some extent. Um, but the idea that humanistic inquiry, which is what I identify myself with as fundamentally a humanist, it is not only tied to the history of close reading the book or print culture, as you can see from this visualization, right now, our social lives, what it means to be human, understood through networking, publishing, sharing, messaging, discussing, collaborating, and even archiving, is tied in with digital platforms, which have become the curators of public discourse. And we must examine the roles they aim to play and the terms by which they hope to be judged. This, again, is taken from Tarleton Gillespie's The Politics of Platforms, which is something I would also recommend to uh, most of you to have a quick look at. Right. So the supposed crisis in the humanities lies in the confabulations of the print paradigm. And the question then rises, is this crisis in reading a new phenomena? Right. Is this crisis in reading a new phenomena? Uh, fortunately not. So reading has always seemed to be in crisis. Two and a half millennia ago, Socrates invade against the written word because it undermined memory and confused data with wisdom. And this is something that brings us back to this idea of 
data and what it means to be working with humanistic data, which I'll come to towards the end of the presentation. For example, when the codex, the bound book appeared, some conservative Romans almost certainly the first codex is probably the Epic, Gil of the, the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Book of Gilgamesh, which is there in a library in Bulgaria. When the codex, the bound book appeared, some conservative Romans almost certainly went around complaining what was wrong with scrolls. They were good enough for Horace and Cicero. So Gutenberg's press gradually undercut the market for illuminated manuscripts. So in a way, these are all technologies, right? Technology is going to the etymology word techni, which means making. So that those words have to be kept in mind. And this is, again, a quote from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So uh, with that, we, of course, have uh, the print paradigm carrying on. Even in the technological world, we have the Kindle paper white, which actually still uses the printed book paradigm to make it comfortable. Of course, there's the politics and the economics of what sells um, as a book reading uh, artifact. So that's something that we can come back to in the questions as well. So now, now the key question, right? And this is something that I would, <laughs> I mostly ask from fellow humanists, and that's something I want to address head on. So why digital humanities and the dangers? And that's something I'm going to focus on. Um, so the digital humanities is humanities in and for a digital age. Of course, as most of you know, that this idea of digital humanities is debated endlessly. In fact, there's an entire collection and series called debates in digital humanities, but the Definition that I like to use myself comes from Elijah Meeks, who was a librarian at Stanford. And at that point of time, I think Elijah Meeks has recently moved to Netflix about a year or two ago. So Elijah Meeks says that digital humanities is bringing digital tools, objects and techniques to bear on traditional humanities scholarship. So I would like you to keep this definition in mind because digital tools, objects and techniques to traditional humanities scholarship. Of course, traditional humanities scholarship, as we have just discussed, is no longer print bound then. So this definition also takes that into mind. And um, DH would then be a collective singular signifying a wide array of convergent practices. This collective singular is taken from Schnapp and Pressner's Digital Humanities Manifesto 2.0, which I shall also share these references with Rajorshi. Some of them, of course, Rajorshi would be sharing with you on his own. So uh, this is from the Digital Humanities Manifesto 2.0 which says it's a collective singular signifying a wide array of convergent practices. So one of the one of the things to keep in mind is that this idea of digital humanities is not new. Computing in the humanities has been there or humanities computing as it is known now has been there from the mid 20th century at the least. And as you can see, the different disciplines, political science, history, English, media studies, art, languages, linguistics, philosophy, they have been interacting with computing for a very long time. And this is taken from the big scholar and philosopher Jeffrey Rockwell, who talks about so quick example like political science has been doing with intellectual property, cyber politics, computer ethics, English media studies, the kind of disciplines that I come from, bibliography and editorial studies, literary, literature theory, literary theory, cultural studies, game studies have all been intrinsically linking computing and what we understand to be the parent discipline or the liberal arts discipline in this case. So what we need to keep in mind that digital humanities needs to contend with data in and for at least three types of platforms. Uh, one is the platform that we use to presume data. Presume is produce and consume. And this comes from Henry Jenkins's work of convergence culture, platforms that we use to analyze data and platforms that we archive or publish in. This is from Jeffrey D. Winter's work. And of course, you have this fabulous conversation on archives. So I'm leaving, I'm keeping it quite limited because we have limited time as well today. Now, um, let me sort of then go back and say that while digital humanities has been there in the conversation for a very long time, in fact, the first kind of computationally oriented movements in qualitative inquiry has been there since 1887 with uh, Jeffrey Mendel's a characteristic word curves and composition that was published in Science Magazine, where Mark Twain's and Charles Dickens's words were understood through their word curves, which is something known as stylometry. But so the, the, re, the invigoration or the rebirth of digital humanities broadly comes with this 2011 essay from Franco Moretti called Network Theory and Plot Analysis. And Moretti is at the Stanford Literary Lab. And this is very interesting. So what does Moretti do? He takes this scene from Hamlet called The Murder of Gonzago. And he creates the, he creates the main characters as nodes. So he does this network analysis. The main characters becomes nodes. And the conversations amongst them become the edges. 
and what he tries to do is try to understand who is the protagonist so surprise surprise the protagonist turns out to be hamlet from as you can see all the conversation centered around him so moretti's colleagues came and told him a oh, big deal what have you done new what's new about this we knew this for a very long time and then uh, moretti answers this in different ways but i feel the answer is better given by kirschenbaum who says that the goal is not to use the machine to supplant the judgment and expertise of a human expert who has spent a lifetime reading dickinson emily dickinson in this case but rather to see if the classifications can provoke new insights amongst a body of familiar texts so the key question is what is your research question is your research question about um, you know bengali migrants in bihar in the 20th century and you have a population of texts to choose from you do purposive sampling and you choose three texts and then your research question might not require distant reading might do but if you decide to do it from all across all the texts about bengali immigrants uh, in bihar during that period of 20th century then you will probably be uh, using something like distant reading which allows you a wider wider uh, ambit it not necessarily better but wider so that's something i want to keep in mind however i also want to emphasize that along with distant reading for textual data for non textual data we have cultural analytics which comes with lev manovich's work and this is defined as a wide range of so non textual data is defined as a wide range of formats which encompasses everything but language based text you can see i have linked some of these videos which i'll share with rajurshi later on for the interest of time we can't see them so methods for non textual data have are already there so they are include content analysis document analysis composition interpretation semiotic analysis iconography discourse analysis visual social semiotics and multimodal research but cultural analytics through where we use computationally enabled methodologies allows for non textual data to be interpreted in a humanistic paradigm for example say a user generated music video on youtube going back to the previous slide about platforms a user generated music video on youtube can provide insight into how the creators of the video portrayed themselves for example say the mukbang videos where we eat and we expect reactions or the reactions to reaction videos they, we can tell us about the particular creators of the video but also their surroundings and the viewers comments which you can scrape through multiple uh multiple paradigms at this point of time so i'll take questions at the end if you could hold on to your questions i'll definitely keep a little bit of time for questions so the viewers comments on the video can help researchers understand the culture surrounding the video what is the specific setting that frames the video so that that so that particular video can be seen at three levels at the least now so just to do a quick i i do a longer historical analysis but because we have limited time again i would do sort of a two a very broad based and again please understand this is a simplification this is a generalization that there are two large waves of digital humanities the first quantitative wave begins with father robert tobusa who tied up with thomas watson at ibn to create a concordance of saint thomas of aquinas's works and this is understood to be the first digital humanities work while it had its own problems especially in terms of gender because there are a lot of women programmers and coders on data entry operators who are not mentioned in this project this is understood to be the beginning of digital humanities digitization projects creating the infrastructure database search and retrieval text analysis so you have lots of other projects like digital dun the cervantes project lots of things the rosetti um, uh, archives that come into play and then we have when we once we have this sort of digitized projects and archives on the world wide web and not the internet because of the two different things the world wide web as they come up we move into the second qualitative wave which is interpretive research we then have some, something like tei text encoding initiatives coming into play once we understand there are certain objects that have to be framed in a certain manner and for born digital materials we have new paradigms and digital toolkits we also have the rise of new disciplinary paradigms for example a very interesting and important disciplinary paradigm important to acknowledge is electronic literature which is literature that gets born digital right it it is born from the network terminal so that's something that you can have so if you type electronic literature organization um uh, shout out to one of my students uh, mr shamo broto roy who's just started uh, electronic literature india organization as well so yeah that's something that you can have a look at so while what is digital humanities is often talked about this is a question that is less talked about right so who is a digital humanist i think that's a very important point as well okay and this is not all inclusive 
but this is in reference to the definition that i have operationalized which is uh, traditional humanistic enquiry mapped to digital tools techniques and objects so first one let's take the computational humanist who works with digital techniques right so what are digital techniques so the computational humanist for whom computational technology has become the very condition of possibility required in order to think about many of the questions raised in the humanities today for example a recent project of mine where i was trying to understand how is covid 19 health promotion and policy carried out by the ministry of health and family welfare on the world wide web uh, required me to scrape data from twitter so twitter and its resultant data is the very you know becomes the very possibility for my research question to exist so this would rather be the computational humanist as i have mentioned here and he or she works or they work with digital what we understand to be techniques next we move to the multimodal cultural scholar so the multimodal cultural scholar would be probably very easy to understand for any of literary and cultural studies scholars who explores new forms of literacy beyond the print paradigm that include authoring and analyzing visual oral dynamic and interactive media in a more immersive and sensory rich space so a new media studies scholar a game studies scholar would be a multimodal cultural scholar finally the digital archivist and it's a very important point and i'm looking forward to if venkat i see is still here so if venkat would probably be questioning this but the digital archive is to purposefully selects online groupings of digital copies of non digital original materials located in different physical repositories or collections in order to support a scholarly goal so there is a lovely essay by kate thimmer archives in context and as context where she talks about herself as an archivist as a tourist in the world of digital humanities because how digital humanists look at archives and how archivists look at archives are often very different so provenance collective control and original order which are the key aspects of an archivist are interpreted very differently by digital archivists but you know broadly we can say that these are physical repos these are uh, non digital original materials being digitized to support a scholarly goal very importantly as you can see in my visualization that i have connected all these three sort of silos suppose